Hey, welcome back to the Fieldcraft Survival Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin. And if you're trying to evaluate whether or not you're going to stay with us and listen to this one, I would highly advise you to do it. Today, I'm sitting down with Sergeant Major Chuck Ritter. Um, Chuck is still on active duty, uh, despite being blown up and shot multiple times during combat. Uh, Chuck and I go way back. We were in the Q course together 20 years ago. Um, yeah, <laughs> off and on. We were, we were instructors together for a short period of time, and then we kind of went on our own paths, right? So I did the podcast for Pineland Underground, which is the special warfare center and school podcast for, for all the, the training element for special operations. Uh, the other day, so Chuck asked me, and I'm like, I'll do yours if you do mine. So um, this podcast is about resilience. It's about getting back up and getting back out there after you've been blown up in a horrific IED, after you've been shot multiple times um, on multiple occasions. Like, it was like, people were like, oh my God, Chuck got shot again. <laughs> <laughs> you're too big. You got to be a little guy like me. Yeah, and you're faster, you're right? harder to hit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in, in a world where we have the internet and social media and Instagram and YouTube follow these guys that are Navy SEAL this and Green Beret that and Special Operations this and that. Chuck's the real deal. Chuck's a freaking hero. Chuck's a badass, but he, he's one of these guys that will never talk about himself. So we're going to go down this road. After we worked together years ago, I ended up at your house in Fayetteville after you'd been blown up probably a while and i was shocked because all your teeth were gone yeah. and i remember you telling me that because you lived in Fayetteville and you were close to the ranges when the artillery would go off your whole body would shake i don't know mm -hmm. if you remember that but you, your rehabilitation was long mm -hmm. but when it was done you got right back out and you went right back out to combat and then I got shot again. And then <laughs> you did all that rehabilitation and went right back out to combat and got shot again. So we're going to talk through that story. I, I, I think it's a, it's a great story of resilience. It might be a good story of what, what not to do, though. Like, <laughs> it's three or five second rush for a reason. It's not seven. <laughs> yeah. You're so, you should have duked when you're diving, you know. Um, but, but I think in a world where small things happen to us, and I... I absolutely include myself and we go off like it's the end of the world mm -hmm. well try getting shot and blown up and try hitting an ied where i think everybody else in the vehicle got killed except you right um two people got killed everybody else was seriously wounded yeah i was the only one that was ended up making a full recovery and it was the biggest right. ied at that point in afghanistan yeah. right it was, it was the biggest one or very close yeah when we we just received all the mine resistant vehicles right and then it means like okay well yeah just, well we just up. make a bigger <laughs> id right um so we're going to talk through this, and uh, yeah, this is going to be a good one, man. I'm really looking forward. I've been meaning to get this done for a long time, so um, cool. All right, so I'm going to drive the train here, yep. and uh, Sergeant Major Chuck Ritter is going to answer my questions. Which is weird, because now that I've been doing the Pineland Underground podcast for a minute, I'm used to driving the train. Right, so. right. <laughs> so just sit back and relax. I will try to shut up and let you tell your story, <laughs> but it's not easy for me. Okay, so let's get a little context. Where'd you grow up? Texas. Texas? What part? East Texas. A little really? place called Lufkin. If we want to put the whole resiliency in context, the only time I've ever told this part of the story to anybody is when we did a podcast for Pineland Underground before I was the host, right? But man, I sucked as a kid. So it's not resiliency, but it's just being able to change a faulty mindset. I'm talking $70,000 credit card fraud charge on me. I failed my first drug test for the military. I didn't even really graduate high school. If you remember during our podcast... We, we discussed recruiters and how it's not that easy to join the army mm -hmm. in Ireland. But in the U.S., if you if you walk past a recruiting station, like tentacles come out. Oh, and grab yeah, your ass they'll grab you. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I was working, uh, 17 years old, I was working at a radio shack right next to the recruiting station. This recruiter was always bothering me. But I still had, I was going to the special school. What year? This was, shit, 1994 maybe? Okay. Um, maybe 95. This recruiter kept kept saying, hey, why don't you join? I'm like, man, I'm missing. I still have algebra to do. I was going to the special school because I suck so bad <laughs> in school. And I would just go and sleep under the desk and wouldn't do this last credit. So one weekend, we threw a party at my house. My parents were out of town. And we broke into the house. They, they were making me sleep in the camper outside because they didn't trust me. But one of my friends <laughs> found a window open. We went in there, um, and they had these... They had these salmon, these full salmon in the freezer. And I got pictures from that night where we had the salmon. I have a fishing pole, like fishing out of the toilet. It's in a hot tub with me and a bunch of girls. <laughs> Ended up in the backyard. And the next day, I had to clean it off and put it back in the freezer. And my dad tried to cook it a month later and didn't turn out so well. But anyway, um, 
<laughs> it's Sunday, and I'm cleaning up my house because my parents come back the next day, and there's a knock at the door, and the recruiter shows up. He's like, hey, check it out. He's got my high school diploma and my transcripts. He's like, you graduated high school, all right? And I'll give these to you if you go to MEPS. Really? Tomorrow. Yeah, and I was like, oh, man. I was like, okay, I'll be here at 6 o'clock in the morning. So he left. I called my buddy up. I'm like, yo, how much weed do you have? <laughs> and he's like, what? Why? I was like, just bring it all over here. I got a drug test that I got to take tomorrow that I cannot pass. He's like, what? That makes no sense. I'm like, it makes perfect sense if you just don't think about it, right? So he came over. I went to MEPS, got my high school diploma and everything. We were there all day long. Recruiter called me like on a Wednesday or Thursday. He's like, hey, man, like you failed the drug test. You what, can't you join the Army. <laughs> what, was your, what was your rationale to smoking weed to beat a drug test? Oh, you didn't no, want to go in? No, I didn't want to go in. Oh, I get you But now. I wanted my high school diploma. <laughs> <laughs> You see, unconventional warrior right there. Think outside the box. But then when I got my when I got my shit together, like a year later to, to join, it took I had to get a letter from a congressman. And to this day, that failed drug test like hits me up in my security clearance really? every single you time. You know what hits yeah. me up or did when I was in the military? The time I got arrested when we worked really? together. That yes, one? that hit me up for years and years later. Like that got, you, that, nothing came of that. Nothing came of it. Doesn't matter. It was on my record, right? Yeah. Um, another story. Go ahead. Yeah, but anyway, how old were you? That was when I was like 17, 17 right? but I just yeah. sucked, man. Mm -hmm. like, my, my mom was scared of me. She'd sleep with a gun under her pillow. <laughs> um, I failed at a bowling class in college, right? That's kind of when I was like... Bowling? Was kinda, bowling class, yeah. Uh, I didn't even... Yeah, I okay. don't think about it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so I failed out of college because of bowling class, mm. and I was like, man, I got to do something with my life, and that's when I joined the Army, but... Did anybody in your family in the military? Any yeah, both my parents in the military. Really? Yeah, yeah. that's why my mom was real pissed because she, she was an officer, Oh. Uh, and she worked at the college that I failed out of as a yeah. nursing instructor. So it was real embarrassing for the family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, uh, did you have like anybody that was a mentor that told you about the military other than your parents? Because it, it's different from your parents, right? Mm -hmm. The, um, it, you know, what do your parents know? My God. like that, yeah, exactly, you know, right? The, um, but uh, nobody else like as a mentor that no, kind of... It was, and it was a weird time in the 90s. The, the military was not... It, it had been gutted by the Clinton administration. There wasn't a lot of money in it. And, uh, you know, you had the Gulf War, early 90s. But I'm sure, like, the Gulf War, like, I was slave to the TV that whole time. It was, like, fascinating Were to me you? that we could bring that much firepower to bear on right. somebody, right? Yeah, like, yeah. So as, as a 14, 15-year-old, you were like, oh, my God, this is awesome. So yeah. I think it was probably inherent in you. Like, it is in a lot of young people mm -hmm. that drive to serve was always there, mm -hmm. but you were probably resistant because your parents, right? Because what did they know? know? I think I just sucked. I was pretty much resistant to any smart decision in life at that point. In time, I, will so. I, I will, I will, I will testify to the fact that seventy-year-old boys are dumb as a box of rocks, <laughs> and I was too. I was a nightmare. But uh, I never fished salmon out of the toilet. No, never did. And that. then put it back in the freezer. <laughs> Like, I finally told my, my dad the truth about that party right before he died, um, probably 2013. He was like, what? He's like, I remember that week. Because they had somebody important, like the mayor or somebody over, and they cooked this nice dinner, and it sucked. <laughs> you all got food poisoning. <laughs> but the whole point there is that, you know, you're going to talk about resiliency, but also you, you can go from having a, a corrupt, faulty mindset mm -hmm. and change yourself, you know, as long as I think you make, it's not just this isn't a change, but then you got to turn things into habit. Yeah. Right? And mm -hmm. then once you do that, Mm. You can conquer the world. I, I don't like when young people make a mistake early and it crushes them for the rest of their life. Yeah. You know, and I don't know that you can go in the military now if you have a charge like that. Really? Maybe I'm wrong. I remember being in the recruiter when my uh, niece's husband was joining, right? And I went in there to help him out. And it was during the Obama administration where he couldn't have tattoos. And this young kid came in with his dad, and he wanted to do something with his life. And they're like, oh, let me see that tattoo. Put your hand over it. Mm -hmm. Remember that was the rag? Yeah. If you couldn't cover it, you had, they're like, go away. Yeah. And that I kid, would, yeah. Yeah, I'd be screwed. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> but um, th that that was that crushed recruiting, and it got changed later on. Yeah. So I, I, I do like if there's a way for somebody who's made mistakes, which is part of growing up, to, to change that and get back. And, and the military is a great place for a guy like you and me to give you structure in your life, yeah. right? Um, all right, so it gives you that habit every day doing the it same does. things. And it then does. People yeah. will give you instant feedback if you're screwed up or not, right? <laughs> they will, especially in the army, and it hurts in the infantry. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, yeah. It's painful. oh yeah, yeah. So, um, so you got your high school, excuse me, you got your high school diploma, and then what? What triggered you to say, screw it, I'll do it? Uh, failing at a bowling class was finally like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> probably time to go do something worth the shit and then when yeah. i joined though also a little known fact 
My first APFT. Army, Army Army PT test. Yeah, what do you mm-hmm. think I scored? Good guess. Out of three hundred possible. Mm-hmm. One fifty. One fifty. 194 points in all three events. <laughs> the briefing where they, they tell you, hey, you can walk, but it's not recommended. I tell you that the heart. It's like a 24 minute, two mile run. <laughs> <laughs> and I was dying. <laughs> so there you have it. If, if you're like going into, you think you're going to join the army, but you think you're not smart enough or physically fit enough, there's a guy who failed his first PT <laughs> test and failed bowling class. It's rolling a ball down yeah. a, a, an alleyway. And now I'm a, I'm a sergeant major. And now you're a sergeant forces. major. <laughs> you're the deputy commandant of the non-commissioned officer academy in, for special operations. Mm-hmm. There you go, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So basic training. Yeah. Basic for, training. Fort Benning. Is, yeah. Fort Benning. Mm-hmm. You know, infantry basic. What year? That was 1998. Damn. Okay, I was there ninety six, yeah, so I was so a little bit ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a great time. I'll be honest with you; I, I thought basic training was fun. Yeah, like even though I was sucking, <laughs> and they were like that first five mile run we did, I was the only dude falling out. Uh, but I, it, I felt like I learned a lot there, not just about myself, but about mm-hmm. people. And yeah, people. when there are people there that, you, I mean, you know, you were there. It's not there's was, some people in there that you're like, how are you even alive? Right? I know. Yeah, yeah. There, there were some people there from like the backwoods, man, mm-hmm. and that had grew up in little towns with 50 people in them and yeah. had never been out of their, their town. Um, but it really does open up your eyes mm-hmm. to the world. Like I was older when I went there, but um, it really does. Um, did you get in shape before you went there? No, no. 94 points was at basic training. Oh, so that, that, by, by the time yeah. I graduated, I had a 220, which I thought was amazing until yeah. I went to Hawaii and signed in there like a 220. Like what? You can't sign in with a 220? <laughs> Like, yeah. man, if you don't have like a 260 yeah. here, like, yeah. yeah. And back then in the 90s, you had to, you had to be better than your Peters because it's hard to get promoted, right? It's super hard. Like, so the PT system? was one of the ways you you mm-hmm. you stood out as an infantry soldier. In, uh, your uniform, your boots, um, your knowledge of garbage that you'll never need in your life, like, mm-hmm. and and PT was a big one. And then going to the board or getting your EIB yep. was a huge one. And then one, all right? you remember the time you had the correspondence courses? Yes. Points for yeah. So my wife is sitting there behind the camera. She did all mine for me. What? So they would mail, they would mail you the books, yeah, right? The Before ones. the internet, right? Yeah, yeah. And you would do all these <laughs> questions and answers. I was deployed and she got them home and she did them all for me because it was promotion points to get promoted. Yep. I remember she did the dragon missile and got a hundred percent. that one, yeah. Didn't even know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's the team effort. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so you got in the military, you went through basic training. You went to Hawaii, 25th infantry Light Division. Infantry yeah. in Hawaii. How'd you get the Jasper out or just, just That's Jasper? That was one of the options. And yeah, and just, hey, if anybody's thinking about joining the military, like recruiters will pull you in there, but the, they're not there for you. They're there mm-hmm. for the numbers. So you pick yeah. what you want yeah. and tell them what your what MOS you want. Yeah. And if they want you in, they're going to get you there and then where you want to go. Like yeah. they have that option. They yeah. can do that. And yeah. what they'll say too is like, if it's, it's August, right? And they'll go, you go, I want to go in next month in September. Oh, I can't get you into October. They're trying to get their quota. They already yeah. have their quota for September and they want to push you to October for yeah. them. And you can say, no, I'm going in. Yeah. Um, don't be like me. I went in and said, I want to go in the army. I want to be an infantry guy. And me, special operations guy, all, all this background, E1, private yeah. E1 <laughs> coming in with nothing. And uh, I thought it was great because they let me in. <laughs> um, so you you were schooled. So you went in there and you got. Did you want to go Hawaii? Was that? Yeah, the, I asked to go to Hawaii. Okay. I got that and the, whatever the bonus was at the time. And yeah, I was Hawaii as a private. I, no, it was awesome. I think that's one of the best duty stations you can go to. Really? Uh, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, you, you get afforded so many opportunities in the military anyway. But there, every weekend, we were running from the barracks up this mountain to the top of this. Uh, or all over the top of this mountain that's kind of the, with the saddle where a lot of the planes came through during Pearl Harbor, but you could see the, the entire island from there. Mm-hmm. So we do that every weekend, hard training out there. Just a great opportunity. And we went from there, you were really busy. You know, went to the big island and we're, you know, as a private, we're dropping bombs from BPD-2s, carpet bombing the lava fields there, doing mm-hmm. battalion live fire maneuvers. And then we went to the National Training Center to where, at the time it sucked, but we were humping tow missiles up in these mountains. Mm-hmm. We're like, hey, this is a good idea. I mean, it's like 200 pounds of stuff you're mm-hmm. humping up this mountain. But then we got up there and we took out a whole battalion of armor that was down below us because they didn't yeah. expect people to be up on the mountain. Because you, you were willing to do the work. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you know, JRTC, great time. First time I... Yeah. So I so NTC is in California. Yep. JRTC is in Louisiana, right? Yeah. Yeah. From yep. Polk, Louisiana. Was the 25th at the time concentrated on jungle warfare? Was that their thing or no? We didn't call... I mean, it's the jungle, right? Yeah. But you, you didn't 
call it jungle. There wasn't the school of jungle warfare. Yeah. There. I know they had that previously. Yeah. But over there was just. I mean, you were, you just knew that you were good at at jungle stuff. And I thought mm-hmm. in my head because they they've got gulches in Hawaii too, and gulches are these giant, basically bottom it seemed like bottomless pits like these trenches and they're they're from the lava field so you might mm-hmm. go 600 meters in two hours and i was like oh this is going to set me up for selection when it went to selection mm. nothing sets you up for draws no out here in north carolina yeah in the i teach land up, i teach land up here a lot and there's kids going to q course and i'll be like uh, you see this thing here with this, <laughs> this squiggly blue line that is death that has brought people to tears many many times you will get in there and it will change your life it will <laughs> yeah it will uh, it, it's and it looks they're like oh i'll just cross here and i was like okay that's nine hours in a yeah. drive <laughs> <laughs> it looks real small on this map yes it does but yeah, wait a minute yeah. vines are stronger than you you're gonna get in there and just like i should have done more lunges <laughs> it's and- so funny man it really is um it's actually one of the hardest places i've ever landed up here it is because there's no terrain features mm-hmm. and it all looks the same and you see you see like people looking at contour lines here mm-hmm. and they look at these bigger maps where the contour lines are 40 feet apart mm-hmm. and they're 10 feet apart here and they're like yeah. well i'll go to that hilltop and i'm like okay that hilltop <laughs> is like that the, yeah. the top of that cabinet right yeah, there you you're not gonna know it is, yeah. yeah yeah um it, it, it's a pretty unique place um all right so 25th infantry uh private ritter mm-hmm. keeping your shit together no I, well i Kind of. I would get my ass smoked every single yeah. day. I was always in Spits and Starks out low crawling in the quad looking for bottle caps for some stupid shit. Why? Shredded. Just for not having... Uh, well, you know how it was back in the day. Like if you showed up without your Army Values car, yeah. your Army Values dog tag signed. Or, yeah, it was so um, stupid. It really was. <laughs> and you had you'd a lot of NCOs that had never been to combat. They yeah. were very garrison focused. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I remember that. That was a rough time. Yeah. To be so in the I don't even think I deserved it half the time. But I got a lot stronger. Yeah. Right. It took me about eight months to where I was scoring, you know, right at three hundred points in the APFT, and I, you know, you always go on your ups and downs. But I pretty much maintained that when I was younger. And the standards used to be harder. Mm-hmm. For I mean, everybody says, oh, when you're younger, it's always harder. But back then, you had to run. I think an eleven fifty seven to max your run. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there's more there's more strict standards i think with the old pt test and they've, they've implemented a new one right now yeah. right and so with the old one you learned how to take it you learned where to put the effort in you learned how to yeah. do it and once you learned how to get a 300 it was pretty easy to to sustain i think i spent nine months in kosovo like uh 99 and 2000 and i never did pt once mm-hmm. i came back and did a pt and got 100 nice. or 300 people were like how did you do that um i i i, I yeah we, we talk about the the how the army's changed later mm-hmm. on, um, and the PT test is one of them. I'd like to get your take on that because because the NCO Academy is a big kind of proponent of yeah, that. The you, new one, I mean, the new ACFT, the Army Combat Fitness Test. We're the first ones really implementing it, or we yeah. have been. Yeah, and it's logistically very difficult to, to do. Yeah, people don't think of that, but that when they write it, they're mm-hmm. like, "Oh my God, it's going to take this many people to run it," and it's not. A, yeah, before it was pretty easy. Mm-hmm. You could run it pretty easy. You need much. I remember stopwatch. Yeah, and I remember running it out at the, the Warrior Leader course when I was the first sergeant out mm-hmm. there, and I'd be counting push-ups. I'd be like 25, 26, and I'd count to myself, and 27, 28, and then I'd be like, oh, man, what have I got today? i got to do emails, <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, shit, I lost count. Uh, uh, 51, 52. <laughs> I'd just pick up somewhere, and then I got these little counters, yeah, man, because yeah. I couldn't focus my attention long enough. Um, you almost need those if you have, if you have AD, AD, ADHD, yeah. you need the yeah. counter. or TBI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or both. <laughs> So, um, get, getting smoked pretty good. Push-ups, uh, <laughs> did you, uh, you didn't get any Article 15s or anything, right? Yeah, I never got in trouble. I, was, I think I was a pretty decent soldier yeah, overall. Yeah, I, Somebody I mean, asked me recently, how many Article 15s did you get? I'm like, I was not that guy, man. I was pretty squared away, and I followed yeah. the rules. I think the worst um, thing I did was I left my pro mask out in the formation area one day. Mm-hmm. So then they gave me this little brown toad with... Um, plastic bullets wrapped around it and a little M60 and I had yeah. to carry that wherever I went like the shop at I, they caught me in the weekends I had to carry that for like two weeks <laughs> I right? think that's great training <laughs> they won't allow you to do that anymore I remember being an NTC and I saw this guy from another unit at Chow Hall and he had his saw his 240, uh, 249 machine gun and he had a chain wrapped around him and it, it was padlocked to him like this chain was not like a bike chain. It was like something yeah. you'd tie a ship up with, right? Mm-hmm. And it was wrapped around him, and he'd obviously left it somewhere and forgotten it. But that's corrective training. I love that. Never forgot it again. He right? probably never forgot it again. Yeah. And uh, the uh, I think that's great, but they're not allowed to do that anymore. I think that's yeah. pretty frowned upon. Remember when uh, you got promoted back then? Mm-hmm. They would take the the backers off your rank oh, and yeah. put it in, and then beat it into yeah. your chest. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> 
<laughs> as long as that ranked you. <laughs> People didn't want to get promoted. It was funny. All right. So how long did you spend in Hawaii? Uh, three years. Three years with the selection. Mm. And then... What year did you go to selection? 2002. Well, I went, no, so I went to selection in 2000. Yeah. And then I just didn't, I didn't come over for another year. So I came mm. over for a year. And mm. that's when we went to the Q course together. 2001, mm-hmm. 02 time frame. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. When you were displaced like that, it was the same with me. I went to selection right after 9-11. But I didn't actually go to the Q course till the end because you have to go back to your duty station, yeah. out process, and do, and mm-hmm. then come back. So, um, so we end up. I think we're probably in in the small unit tactics portion in the mm-hmm. end of two thousand two together, mm-hmm. and then we went to the uh, eighteen Bravo Special Forces mm-hmm. Weapons Sergeant course. Which there's a million stories there. People are like, "What did you learn in the weapons course?" I learned how to do flutter kicks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we went to Robin Sage, even though we weren't the same team. And then we went to, we were in a language, what language did you get? French, French. probably, yeah. But in the weapons art course, you also learn at the recoilless rifle day that if you, when you fire that many recoilless rifles in yeah, a day, you yeah. are sick for you like a week. Are, That's yeah. probably didn't help our brains either. Yeah, we were shooting those, shooting those, uh, what are they? The 105s. The 105s, Remember right? we had to stand in between them. <laughs> yeah, so we were standing in between them and there's a 105 on each end yeah. and they were shooting a boom! It's like a punch in the face every time. And I remember Edgerly. So I looked behind Edgerly, and this is a dick move. I'm not proud of it. He had his fingers in his ears because he didn't have ear pro. Mm-hmm. And right was it was about to fire. I hit him like here, and I went boom. And he went ah. And then, <laughs> oh, that is a dick move. TBI. Yeah, that, that is a dick move. Um, when you're young, you can take those explosions and shoot guns with no ear pro. When you're older, it's like damn, that shit hurts. Yeah, it does. Um, but uh, that the. the the 18 Bravo course at the time, it was like now, but um, a lot of it was on the job training when you got to your team and you oh, start yeah. figuring things out. Because yeah, we didn't do a whole lot of Martin 19, 50 Cal in no. the Bravo course. We did some, yeah. but then when we, when we got to Afghanistan again, that was like your primary weapon systems that you had to be really good at. Yeah. And those were real finicky. I, I uh, When I got to my team, I was running a pistol range with the Beretta. And four locking blocks broke. It's the part yeah. that breaks more than any other part in any gun I've ever mm-hmm. seen in my life. I don't know how to change it. Nobody showed me on the Bravo course, but I could disassemble a Dishka machine yeah. <laughs> gun, which I never really touched again. Like mm-hmm. it was just there was certain things that you can employ a Stinger missile or yeah. an SA7. Uh, yes, but uh, never touched one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like French. Never spoke <laughs> French again after language school. Yeah. Um, cool, but um, went through the the 18 Bravo course. Uh, Language school, Seer school. Seer is survive, escape, resist, evade. And we were in prison together getting slapped. <laughs> um, Everybody loses their mind at least once. <laughs> they do. They absolutely do. I think me and you, I don't want to give anything away from Seer school, but I think at one point, I think it was you I was talking to. I was like, dude, I'm hallucinating. And I thought I saw a chicken. And you're like, there is a chicken there. I see it there. <laughs> I need chickens running around. I don't know why, but... Um, Great school, mistake best based learning. I wasn't getting it, man. Somebody, and it might have been you. I was like, dude, I am getting my ass kicked in those interrogations. I don't freaking get it. I think we both were. I think the instructors. I know he came out with me with his ID card. He came out of role. He's like, look, he's yeah. like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, what do you mean? What's wrong with me? He's like, why do you keep doing these things? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It's a, it's a good course, man, and. Uh, I'm glad I went through it, but it yeah. sucked at the time. I don't know if you remember this or not, but I, I found a peanut on the ground at one point, and I was like, holy shit, there's a peanut. <laughs> and I came up to you and a couple of guys was like, there's a peanut. What do I do with it? You're like, eat it. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, like, well, you don't think we can split it up? And you're like, you don't split up a peanut. <laughs> you just eat it. <laughs> it's funny how you can break the human mind down very quickly, right? And it wasn't like we were escaping an invasion for a couple of days before. Mm-hmm. Did you guys find any food on your lane? Uh, actually, we caught a fish. Mm. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And nice. then I didn't know what deer corn was. So mm-hmm. I was boiling the shit out of this deer corn for like three hours. I'm like, what the hell is it's wrong like with this rocks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we did the same. We got, oh, deer corn, awesome. And we tried to eat it raw. And it is like rocks. And then we yeah. boiled it and boiled it and boiled it, and it didn't Nothing. change structure at all. So you can crack it, actually, in the bottom of a, your tin cup. I didn't know that. So it's more we like a We did that. Yeah, like we, found that. we found an old shovel, mm-hmm. and we put it on the fire, and we cracked crack it like it. popcorn. Yeah, Psh, I, think it was, I think we burned more calories trying to get the shit Probably. edible than we gained. And we, we, the instructor brought us a roadkill squirrel between oh, five of us. <laughs> Not that much on a squirrel. Um, yeah. And then he brought us a... He brought us a couple of 
sausages. Like what? Well, will I, t- will I tell you? Will I tell you? Will I tell you? He brought us like three or four sausages, and he said, these are for using as bait and traps, because I want you to exercise the traps. And we're all sitting around the fire, and he's like, I know what you're thinking. As soon as I leave, you're going to eat them. He says, I stuck three of those four in my ass before. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, go ahead. <laughs> so we didn't eat them. We were like, I can't do it. I can't do it. So good for you. Um, so we actually landed in a radish field, because we got, we got inserted via helicopter. And uh, so we put all these radishes in our rucksack. So to this day, to this day, I can't eat radishes. Really? Yeah. Because yeah. I'm just sitting there like eating it raw. Like because during the day you're just sitting out in the sun, like just waiting for, yeah. for nighttime so you yeah. can move. Yeah. Yeah. Just no and you radishes. just info. You're probably not that hungry yet. Nope. So you're trying to eat it because you know you need mm-hmm. it. But when after a couple of days, um, I, did you get hungry in Sarah's call? Nah, I really didn't mm-hmm. either. They fed us this rice with fish heads in yeah, it, and it was, it was pretty so disgusting. That kind of ruined everything for you. Yeah, I don't think I ever had rice again. Um, <laughs> it was funny, but great school, great, great training. So at the end of that, and we talked about this on the Pineland Underground class, uh, but we, we'll hit it briefly. <laughs> so me and Chuck are like, damn, two wars going on at this point. Mm-hmm. Rack invasion already happened. Afghanistan's ru- ru- third group involved yeah. in both, I think. Um, and we already went to third group and got ourselves jobs. Yeah, yeah. And then they're like, hey, as we were out processing, they're like, hey, um, we need, because they were pulling a lot of instructors back to group, uh, they're like, we need people to be small unit tactics instructors. Mm-hmm. And a 750 ramp up too. So they just get in that directive that you have to produce 750 students yes. a year. Yeah, yeah. So they were trying to f- ramp up the, the production. They were pushing people to Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> And they were pulling people out of schools and everything mm-hmm. at the time. I remember when I was in Sephardic years later, there was a, a 10th group instructor that was, they were pulling guys back and he was wanting to go back because they were deploying. Mm-hmm. And he was like, eventually he was told to go back to Colorado to his unit. And he's like, I jumped in my car, I hauled ass. And I, he was like, I was speeding, but I figured if any cop, at that time there was so much patriotism in the country and all that after 9-11. Mm-hmm. He's like, if some cop stops me, I'll just pull my ID card and say, I'm a special forces, I have to get back to my unit. Like, I'm really in a hurry. And sure as hell, he got stopped like in Illinois somewhere. Cops pulled him over and he said, I'm army special forces. I'm on my way back to my unit. I'm in a big hurry. And the cop said, okay, I'll be right back with your ticket. <laughs> So that we got caught in the perfect storm because we were both 11 Bravos and we were waiting. We were both these sixes and they were like, the following people will go over here. And we were like, what? And they're like, you're going to be assistant instructors at the small unit tactics course, even though we hadn't been to a team yet, but it's basic infantry skills, right? It's nothing to do with special forces, really. So we were all trying to come up with a strategy to get out of it. And they brought us up to see the, the training group CSM. Well, you were convinced you were going to get it. Oh, I thought I was. I was I was actually a promotable E6. I was going to be an E7 by the time I got to my team. And I was like, I, I'll, I'm pretty convincing. I'll talk myself out of this. And then that kid said, the Sergeant Major said, you were the best guys we could find to do this job. Bullshit, right? You're just the right MOS, right place, wrong time. Um, and he said, you guys were the best ones we could find. And this kid said, hey, Sergeant Major, I failed small unit tactics when I went through the course. I had to get recycled. And the smart Sergeant Major said, well, this is a good chance for you to brush up on your skills. So I was like, there's no point in argument. This is going to happen. So we worked together. And, and we were lucky. I think we only did like six months or something mm-hmm. like that. And then we got we got uh, released back to group. Yeah. Okay. So I went my way. I went into Bravo 3-3. Mm-hmm. Where did you go? I went to Charlie 3-3. Okay. So I went to 392, and I forgot what team you were on at the time. At 386, and we actually flew to Afghanistan together, yeah. to Kandahar. Yep. Um, that was an interesting trip. I mean, that was back when there was nothing there. It was oh. no built up. It was the Wild West. Huge bases. It was you alone and unafraid mm-hmm. out in the wilderness mm-hmm. with a bunch of people that don't share your culture or anything, really. Yeah. Yeah, I remember landing in Kandahar that time and waiting for a ride to Bagram to get to my team. And I could hear music across the street. Remember this? And it wasn't built up at all, but we were starting to make, in my opinion, at that time, we were starting to make the same mistakes we made in Vietnam, this massive footprint of conventional forces in an unconventional war. And I walked up to the the wire and I looked across to the Air Force Base across the street and they were playing volleyball with the mm-hmm. lights on, blasting music. And, and I was like, what is going on? I thought I was going into this austere combat, which I did later on. And so did you in the middle of nowhere, sleeping in your truck and freaking um, out for weeks at a time. But at that time, I found that a very surreal image mm-hmm. where 
all these people had so much time to play volleyball. Yeah. I just couldn't believe it. But yeah. So you, you, when you we were, you probably don't, don't remember this, but you, the chow hall at the special forces compound we were had these trash bins behind it. And I, I'd never seen an Afghan before. So there was these four Afghans and they were just squatting on top of this, this, this trash bin mm-hmm. for like hours. I'm just sitting there looking at them. You can't be like, Chuck, why are you so infatuated with these guys? It's like, what are they doing? They're just, they're squatting on top. He's like, that's just what they do, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's the same way they stare at you. Yeah. I call it American TV where they just sit and stare at you for hours. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, why are they looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> but how, when you left Kandahar that time, where did you go? So I got on a Chinook and I went out to Camp Lane, which was about an hour south of Kalat, which Kalat, if you can picture Afghanistan, it's kind of right in the middle of mm. the ring road right there. Mm-hmm. Sorry. An hour north of Kalat. Fairly hot area. Hot area. Mm-hmm. Nothing. It was it was just south of a place called De Chopin, which had been a if, if you read any of the books yeah. from the Russian mm-hmm. era, like that's that's yeah. where a lot of the fighting mm-hmm. happened. Um, but it was way in the middle of nowhere. So I remember this bird lands and I'm a new guy, I'm all kitted out and I don't know what to expect. The ramp goes down and all of a sudden it's seven people with no shirts on goggles little sh- the shortest shorts you could ever possibly get four wheelers and they're like come on new guy get out here yeah. and i'm like what the hell is going on and they got all their supplies and everything else and uh there was gun trucks on all the apexes pulling security but these guys only had pistols on I'm like what the hell is going on I'm like oh yeah we own this place we've got 400 afghan militia around mm-hmm. and they loaded my stuff up and so it was a fire base it was a fire base okay. in the middle of nowhere and they just constructed this fire base about four months prior. So there's mm. no running water. There's no electricity. Mm. We didn't have generators there. Uh, at the time, they were hooking one up for what they were, they were going to install these reefer vans and everything. But at the time, we are just living off MREs. Mm-hmm. And incrementally, we, we got it to where we had a shower made, but we'd pump water from the, the, the river once a week up into that thing. And mm-hmm. just gravity fed, That's right? good Grim Bray shit right yeah. there, man. And, and I always look back, and, and we both had a lot of luxurious trips later on with mm-hmm. chow halls and internet and all that back then in that austere environment was one of the best times ever mm-hmm. man because you are out there on your own doing your thing with no but back then nobody was looking at you really because you were so far out there and they uh, no support they just said go figure it out yeah. which is what we're good at right yeah, yeah. how was your team was generally good. so we had we had two teams there right uh the team that i signed into 392 didn't deploy as a team. They, they broke that team up, so it was a Halo Team 394 that I was attached to as a Bravo. Uh, but I got in there and screwed it up right away. You know, I came in like, oh, shit, I was an instructor for, for six months. I have arrived, right? Like, yeah, yeah. No, that's not the it's way okay, it works. okay, guys. I got this. Yeah. <laughs> not the way it works. So uh, some of those guys just hated me right off the bat because of the way I came in. Because they came in like, here's your room, and it's an empty room with no beds built or anything. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a hammer, there's some nails, and shit, I, I'd never used tools before my life so i'm like hey can you guys help me they're like what are you talking about fuck no you can figure it out mm. so i mean they're building my bed i'm screwing it all up it's it's cattywampus they're like oh this new guy sucks <laughs> 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 you know because i came in i was like oh you know i made that graduate the q course can be treated like uh mm. like anybody else but the reality is no matter where you go in life no matter what job you're coming into like you there's no I have arrived. You have to prove yourself. Mm-hmm. And no matter what, even as an E9, I mm-hmm. walk into my new job. It doesn't matter what I did yesterday. Mm-hmm. Nobody gives a shit what you did mm-hmm. yesterday. All they care about is what are you bringing to the table today? Mm-hmm. That's what I didn't realize. A lot of people don't realize. You know, they come in. No. Uh, I'm here, guys. It's like, all right, yeah. shut the fuck up and go. <laughs> take out the trash, right? I, um, I, think, I think the Army's good at keeping you humble, man. Yeah. All the way until you're done. <laughs> like, they're like, oh, great. You you did this this and this. All right, you're screwed Sweet. up now. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah, I won't tell that because it, it, the person will know who it is. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but it, again, it was that was out in the middle of nowhere. Before we had that shower set up, if you wanted to go bathe once a week, we'd get under the river and you'd pull security gun trucks. So they probably hit you. Yeah. And you'd get in there and you'd, you'd wash up pretty quickly and get back out. And you had to be careful because there was razor blades on the bottom of the river where the Afghans were in there shaving their, their mm. nutsack, right? <laughs> 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 and they could never figure out, like, these villagers were, were getting sick all the time. And mm. we were like, huh, I wonder what's going on. Like, oh, okay, so you guys are getting water to drink on the downside from where they're all shaving their nuts and washing their sheep. Shitting. Yeah, so mm-hmm. they, yeah. Why don't you guys get water from up here? And they're like, yeah. oh, that's a great idea. Genius. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, that, that, you can see how austere conditions can lead to cholera really quickly. Yeah. Like, right? it's bad. Um, that, what did you guys use for uh, bathrooms, toilets? 
Oh, you know, the, the good old burn shitters, the right? Burn. You got the fifty gallon yeah. drum that you cut in half yep. and you put it in there with mm-hmm. I forgot what we put in the bottom of it, but then kerosene you or get something. really yeah. used to just flies being all up on your butthole, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay it, beca- <laughs> it becomes a little bit normal yeah which is yeah, weird yeah, yeah so it's like 100 degrees in there and then you got to pull it out every day and burn it somebody's yeah. got to burn it it's oh, yeah. usually the new guy mm-hmm. right so yeah you, you get pretty good yeah at it. so there you are non-commissioned officer e6 green beret burning crap because somebody has to do it right yep. um yeah, that, that that's a good way to keep you humble. We, I did that in the desert too, man. In the heat, you pull that thing out, and it's the same thing. If you watch Platoon in Vietnam, you know that movie they're doing that as well. It's it's like a crap detail. That and the piss tubes. Those are always, yeah, those are always yeah. interesting. The Chinese mortar, they call them, where you bury a tube in the ground and you urinate into it into it with a hundred Afghans watching you while yep. you do it. <laughs> and then in the wintertime, it gets frozen. Yes. <laughs> do you remember that team hooked up like an improvised shower? In Afghanistan, and the guy who was on the course with us, he got electrocuted oh, yeah, through yeah. it, right? And I think that was in third group, right? That, mm-hmm. It wasn't third, third group, maybe yeah. third battalion. At the same time, mm-hmm. they rig wire up to to heat the water or something, yeah. and a little bit of eighteen Charlie electricity going on Didn't there. And he work, he yeah. got fried pretty bad, like he recovered, I think. But well, one, um, of, one it happened a couple times. So somebody died. One of the guys died from it. They just mm-hmm. found him like laying in the shower, yeah, and they, and they couldn't figure out at first. And they're like, "Oh, it's hot," and yeah. then they turned the power off and, and dragged him out. So. Oh man, yeah. So back then. It, it, it was very, very Green Beret-ish, right? So it was go in, recruit these guys. There was no Afghan army at that time. It mm-hmm. came not too long after. But it was recruit these militia, go train them, very basically, mm-hmm. which the, the, the SUT instructor thing probably came in really handy. Yeah. And then go hit targets, gather equipment, pit more tar- How was that whole ramp up? So I think back then you had like a 30-kilometer range from the fire base where you could actually... Just do whatever you wanted with impunity without setting up too much. And yeah. you know, you didn't have computers back then out there. So if you wanted to send mm-hmm. something up, it was over the radio. You could maybe send like a two-page Word document, which took about 20 minutes, right? Which mm-hmm. was cool because yeah. nobody really bothered. It's not like today. We're like, yeah. I want a 300-page PowerPoint yes. slide for you to go take a yes. piss. But I'll tell you what it was also. Later on, especially for me and the SIF company, we never rolled out without a Spectre gunship and Apache helicopters and all. Out there, you you'll have be, you, you've nothing. And you'll be in a massive gunfight, and you're still not getting there. Yeah, cause maybe for like, an hour, you'd wait. Yeah. I mean, eventually in Afghanistan, we got it to where your emergency um, combat air support was on station. You get it pretty quickly. But back yeah. then, you didn't. Mm. You might get we, – we had pre-planned B-1 bombers on a lot of missions, especially when we were going back and forth like to Kalat or mm-hmm. we were going up in the valley. But – but dropping bombs from a B-1, it was more yeah. of a show of force. That's it, right, yeah. yeah. That's so it. Yeah. you just really, I mean, people were really ingenious with what they did. The teams would, they rigged up Mark 19s in the back of four-wheelers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All kinds of machine gun mounts in your four-wheelers. You, you did a lot of stuff where you were just really innovative with how you were rigging up your weapon systems and what you were going to do with them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you know how it was back then. Even if something bad happened, you were always taking risks. Like, you'd always be on these roads that, the the tire is coming off the side like an engine. It's yeah. like a two hundred foot drop down, yeah. mm-hmm. and just knowing if something happens, yeah, like what are you really mm-hmm. going to do? That country was made for ambushing people. Oh, yeah. Like there's serious like ambush points in here. I remember driving through, going, "Oh my freaking god!" I I never liked being on the truck because it's a bullet magnet. I would volunteer to get out with the Afghans and push up into the hills on both sides and sweep through the valleys because mm-hmm. I just felt more comfortable on my feet. And I had no body armor, on, I had no helmet on, I had a chest rack, and I was gone because. The, the, those those Afghans man grew up there, so they have mm-hmm. they have a man dress, an AK forty seven, flip flops, and a and a freaking light coat all and a cigarette, and yeah. they're hauling ass. They can move up and down those mountains. Oh, like they're you so believe. fast, yeah. Um, it's like mountain goats. You're like, how did you even get up there? <laughs> but such a great experience early yeah. on, like that, and great to, great to uh, to see it. You guys lose anybody on that trip? No. So that trip there wasn't a, so IEDs really weren't a thing, right? The mm-hmm. Explosive devices and roads weren't really a thing. And then there, there, was there, was no, some, there was no insider attacks back no, then. Was, we hit a few IDs that year, but it wasn't like it was later no, on. No, nothing crazy. Yeah. No, not, not a whole lot of massive firefights because, again, we had 400 militia force. So yeah. every time we went out, we went out with a lot of ass. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't really that bad. We got mortared a lot. We got rocketed a lot. Uh, we did some really cool things, but that trip wasn't really heavily... We didn't have the enemy encroaching on us. We're mm. later trips, especially like the ones where, yeah. you know, we talk about when you're getting mm-hmm. shot up. Like, you're like, damn, we're just going to get overrun. Mm-hmm. You know? it, rockets rockets were fired a lot, but they were very they were very improvised. or yeah. plunked on the side of a hill, mm-hmm. put on a battery, and they haul ass, and they yeah. may or may not hit your, your base, right? Yeah. We got rocketed a lot, too, but a lot of them didn't even hit the mark, yeah. right? Um, they were finding their place, the Taliban, right? Because we just spanked them a year before. Yeah. 
and they'd pulled that and they were starting to come back in at that point and it, it ramped up very very quickly but it was a good way for you to get your feet wet mm-hmm. in that country yep. um and get get kind of know the culture and all that because you've how many times you go to afghanistan I think seven or seven or eight. Yeah, total. that's crazy. That's a seven. I, think. I tell you, for a third group guy, that's not unusual. For no. a guy like you who never got caught for swake like me, yeah. that that that's that's a lot of trips, right? So, um, overall, good trip. No, that was an awesome trip. I mean, but I've never been on a bad trip, even the ones where I got shot. Right, that's the way I look at <laughs> look at life in yeah. general. Is I've never. It pisses me off when when you see some green berets come back from like it just like it was a jace that's stupid or this was dumb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, well, that's because you probably made it dumb. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's always opportunity, and if if you're not in combat, there's training opportunities, and there's stuff you can do in other countries that you can't do here for training and all that. You just make you. It is what you Things make. That it. Other people pay money to do. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, yeah. We're getting paid to go do this thing. That's mm-hmm. Nobody else will ever get to do. Yeah, it. yeah. And you volunteered to do it. Nobody made you. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Any any uh, specific incidents on that trip, good or bad? Nah, that one was that one was pretty. Besides me learning a little humility up front, because mm-hmm. you know, my senior Bravo hated each other when I showed up there, and it was all my fault for, mm-hmm. for for showing up with a little bit of a little bit of ego, right? Mm-hmm. But that's kind of where I learned, like, hey, show up with a little humility and mm-hmm. know that no matter where you go, no matter what you've done in the past, every time you come to a new job, earning that trust by showing competence, it mm-hmm. has to be rebuilt every single yeah. time, no matter what, no matter mm-hmm. what you're doing, no matter how awesome you think you are. Mm-hmm. You have to rebuild that every single time. And your reputation is just that. It's what you did in the past. Mm-hmm. It doesn't fucking matter anymore. Yeah. So that's one thing of advice you give anybody all the time. No matter where you're going, just because you were a good infantryman doesn't mean you're going to be a good Green Bridge. Just because you were a good E7 on a team doesn't mean you're going to be a good team sergeant, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't matter. Like, there's things that go into that new job that you have to prove yourself. Yeah. It should be that way, right? It should be. You should it never absolutely just should be. Hey, I'm here. I'm awesome. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, it was after that was where we did all the back to back trips where we. I think we came back from that trip within four months. Like, I know my team was in Yemen, and then we had to get pulled out of there because it got real crazy. We were pulling security on top of the embassy, and then, like, the week after we left, the, they blew up the they, they bombed the embassy. And then you know, we had a couple of weeks, and we went to Iraq, right? And that's where mm-hmm. we did that big surge into Iraq. In 05? And, yeah, and that was mm-hmm. crazy for everybody. Like, what part of Iraq were you in? We were in Talifar. Okay. So we were with Where's HR Talifar, Master and for people who don't group. know? It's, it's kind of northwest, if I remember correctly, um, from Mosul. Um, mm-hmm. but it was just a, that place had already been cleared before. Like they destroyed the city before and it was owned by Al Qaeda. Mm-hmm. And our first, our first mission was this right seat ride we did with a third ACR. I was like, okay, this isn't gonna be that bad. They gave us an M113 just for our team. We had to learn how to drive it mm-hmm. and it broke down right out of the gate. So that was kind of a, I was like, oh shit. So mm-hmm. they come fix that. And we surrounded this place called Sarai, Sarai district. And I said, Hey, this is going to be pretty wild. Um, but it's okay. But right as the ramps dropped, all of a sudden all hell broke loose. And there was a lieutenant colonel about 100 feet from me, and he just disintegrated in a hail of machine gun fire. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy shit. And they, they had this place surrounded them. There's probably 20 well, tanks. I'm, I'm sorry, just go back. So um, 3rd ACR is a regular army unit. Yep. Were you guys attached to them to lead the mission, or were you just no, no, bumping no, no. up we, their we numbers? Had, we had a special forces company, and I believe we had five special forces team, one of those being... Uh, a National Guard team there yeah. in California to help support their operations and work with the Iraqis, train okay. the Iraqis, and then uh, we had different parts of the city. After this, after this right seat ride, we took different parts of the city. Where you know, for me, it, we had the the center part of the city, and it was cool for me because I would go up with a hundred rounds of sniper ammunition. Yeah. And I would come back with zero every mm-hmm. single time, <laughs> and um, that's back when we had the M twenty four. But on this right seat ride, it showed us how brutal it was because it was just. They didn't care how many tanks and Bradleys that we had, Apaches and Kiowas overhead. Mm-hmm. They just opened up and yeah, where we'd planned to go, the building we planned to go to, we couldn't get to it because there's mm-hmm. so much fire. So I end up in this this building and I look over and this is Racky going through a door and he's got machine gun rounds coming out of his machine gun and they're wrapped around his neck. And I'm like, what the fuck is going? Like, like enemy <laughs> or enemy or friendly? No, it was a friendly guy. Okay, this yeah, is a so friendly you, Iraqi. So you had you had indig with you. You had yeah, we had Iraqi indig, army, yeah. not special operations, the yeah, Iraqi no. army. Yep. But mm-hmm. I was like, man, if this guy pulls the trigger, it's going to take his neck off. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so then, as we're, I was like, all right, get out of the way. So we clear this house because all hell is breaking loose. And I get into the kitchen, and there's there's two doors. There's one to my my front and one to my right. And I was like, all right, we're going in. And so I'm like waiting for the Iraqis to come up, and the Iraqi puts his gun down. And he opens up the refrigerator and he grabs some milk out of the fridge and starts drinking. I'm like, I'm like, man, we're gonna hydrate, we man. We're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea where the other Americans are because yeah. we got split up. Yeah. Um, but we ended up making it to the roof. 
were just taking a massive amount of fire and Kai's were coming in doing gun runs and they were shooting at the helicopters and mm -hmm. this whole day we're clearing through this this part of the city and we're exfilling and all the tanks and stuff were all shot up i mean it's not, not a whole lot of damage to them but just the fact that these guys didn't give a shit yeah mm -hmm. like they're yep. gonna fight to the death mm -hmm. you're in their neighborhood and they're well armed because they mm -hmm. raided all the bunkers there yeah. before we stopped them and uh yeah, and, and I think Telafar was a rat line for foreign fighters coming in, right? It was right? one of the big Al-Qaeda points to where they would bring people in, and that was kind of their staging area. Yeah, yeah. So um, they, did you guys lose anybody on that? Yeah, so we did. Not, no, I don't know how we didn't lose any. We had a couple guys wounded from the teams, but the 30 ACR, overall, where they were, they lost like 54 people that trip. Yeah. I mean, every day they'd be towing in a new tank or a Bradley that got blown up. Mm -hmm. They're using these fuel bombs. And we were going for this one sniper that was there, and a SEAL team actually came in at one point to try to help us find this guy. But he was shooting people with name tape definitely that were going like 45 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so we didn't lose anybody, but there was, I forget how far, into, about four months into it, we were on a mission where we were going after a high-value target. And we had three different target buildings. My element came in, and we finally got to the point to where we were just using Bradleys to back up mm -hmm. to bring down the walls because sometimes we couldn't get through the doors because they'd park cars behind them. And sometimes they just, you know how those massive locks are. You just mm -hmm. couldn't get through them unless you were just using a massive breaching mm -hmm. charge. So our go-to entry technique was to back the Bradley to the wall, drop the ramp, and go in. As we were clear of my building, you could tell that he's where the HB was supposed to be. HBT was supposed to be. There was chai that was still boiling. Or mm -hmm. like, all right, man, this guy ran into the schoolhouse across the street. As the other team started to go in, they started taking just a massive amount of machine gun fire down in the hallways. There's like 32 fighters in that building waiting for him. We had one guy get shot through the neck. He was a third ACR guy. Drag him out. We put him in a, a 113 that had the cross markings on it. It was mm -hmm. a dedicated medevac vehicle. They got about 30 feet down the road, and they blew that thing up. Yeah. Um, they don't care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we ended up losing two guys there. And we were pretty close to these guys. The third ACR guys, like, we spent all our time with them. They were just – it was basically like if we were on a team with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we kept in contact with them after this. So that was – that was pretty intense, but other than that, we didn't we didn't personally lose anybody there. Mm. I don't know how. Mm. It was really weird. It, we were doing we did the siege of Telefar where McMaster's finally just built a berm around the whole city. Mm. He's like, All right, you guys mm -hmm. got seven days to get out. If you stay, we're gonna. It's kill like you. Fallujah. Yeah, and we brought in mm -hmm. two battalions of Kurds and we started in the south, and then we bring the tanks up. The tanks up. We fire what was called OR impad rounds, which are an Israeli made round that would hit the wall and and bring the whole wall down and then we'd go in the buildings and we just did mm -hmm. that throughout the whole city at one point we we got to stop at this point called route barracuda it was a the city the a road that went through the middle of the city they said hey we're going to give the enemy like three days of surrender and then the whole time we're going to give them this time to surrender we were hitting it with ac-130 and apache gunships almost 24 7 because that's how many fighters were there so when you slept at night you'd put a haji blanket over your face so the rounds the the casings mm -hmm. wouldn't hit you yeah, in the face because yeah. you had to sleep if you didn't sleep on the roof you're going to die of yeah heat exhaustion mm -hmm. But it was just wild. We just ended up destroying that city. Mm. Just crushed it. Like, mm -hmm. There was nobody left when we got done with it. And mm. then, yeah, th that's the only way, right? The, the, the counter sniper thing is, is... There was a sniper operator in Mosul when I was there. Same year, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the same guy. But people think counter sniper is like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to observe and look for movement at windows. There's a freaking million people in Mosul. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. That's a lot of movement. And... Um, we did counter sniper ops. We used our indage and we worked with the regular army, right? And one of our guys was actually running our indage in civilian clothes and, and, and civilian cars trying to do this counter sniper op. And he was in the back of a striker, mm -hmm. like in uniform with his M4. And he was with a regular army guy. And as they were driving back in the gate of Mosul, the army guy said, oh, my weapon fired. And he looked down and the dust cover was still closed. And he looked and a bullet had struck oh, his wow. weapon from the sniper on a counter sniper op. <laughs> you know what? well i'm not gonna say that i was gonna say you know how to catch a sniper but i'm not gonna go there um so we, we had that, a gunfire detection system we'd brought one with us did it work it worked but so the first night we set it up because it had acoustic arrays and it was set up there was a camera and it would slew to wherever the gunfire came from mm -hmm. but what it didn't factor is in the first night we set it up we took ten thousand rounds right it was, it was made for snipers <laughs> so it was like <laughs> spinning all over the place it's like burning <laughs> out yeah that's but, funny but where whoever the sniper was mm -hmm. You know, even even when you know where they're at, right? These guys are they're good. They're gonna be a couple rooms deep, probably. Mm -hmm. We would bring Bradleys that were like, he's shooting from here, mm. and we st we couldn't get signature on him. Nothing. It was just the guys were good. Yeah, and I'm sure we ended up killing him in the in the siege of Talifar. He escaped because a lot of people were trying to dress up as women and whatnot. But mm -hmm. 
Um, we never found him before that. And so it, it's so important that these stories are, are, are told because, you know, the, the Fallujah whole thing, that was the same type of thing. And there was probably a lot more fighting going there because they stayed and fought there, right? They stayed and fought with you guys, but they, they fought a tactical withdrawal, I think, right? In that no, one? They, they stayed. They stayed, um, yeah. We just, we just had massive amounts of overmatching mm, firepower. And tanks. Tanks, AC-130, mm -hmm. H-64s. I got some great helmet cam footage, I'll yeah. show you. I just can't release anybody else because it's crazy. It's just, yeah. it's just yeah. us calling in yeah. hellfires left and right. And That's we awesome. We all the Bradleys in the streets beside us. And it's mm -hmm. like, do, 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 do. Yeah. Every time we see them take some rounds, all right, here it is. And we, we finally came to a technique with the Bradleys where we would we would hit the building with Sabo rounds first because that would damage the concrete mm -hmm. and then we'd tidy it up with HE rounds yeah. mm -hmm. and that would actually penetrate the walls and do a lot of damage people, inside. People don't realize how devastating that 25 millimeter oh, cannon yeah, is. It's, it's freaking wicked when you when you use it properly. Yeah. It really is. Um, that's awesome. So on top of your seven Afghanistan trips, was that your only Iraq trip? Did you go back to Iraq That again? was my only Iraq trip. I did it. Yeah. My last trip was to Syria, but yeah, mostly yeah. Afghanistan. Okay. So we're done with that trip. Um, how long was that deployment? Do you remember? Oh, I don't even remember. It was weird, we, but we weren't back that long after that trip because we went back to Afghanistan like yeah. four months later. Mm -hmm. and I was in Ghazni, Afghanistan, and then mm -hmm. we were only home for like four months after that, and that's mm -hmm. when I was in Helmand Province uh, up north mm -hmm. in Sanging where the Brits were, and that's, mm -hmm. that was a trip where, you know, we, we before I, we hit the ID that, that rocked me, we had lost. Uh, we had a lot of people injured okay, in that fire base. Just go back again. Telfar. Telfar. That trip came home. Yep. Home for four months. Yep. Went to Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Uh, fire base or base base? Uh, we went to FOB Ghazni, FOB Ghazni, which was on the highway, but there'd never been a special forces presence there previously. Right. It was pretty neglected. So that place was pretty hot. But mm -hmm. that was one of those ones where, like, hey, you guys figure it out, right? Mm. But they're like, you can't travel without a partner force, which we didn't have a partner force. So we had to be very, we had to be ingenious with what we're doing. Creative. Mm -hmm. And we, it was really me and the senior medic came with this concept of, hey, why don't we. Why don't we set up a police strike force? That sounds like what the governor is saying he needs. So we went with, got with the police chief and the governor. We're like, we sold him this concept. We're like, it sounds like what you guys are at, like needing here. Like, yes. And then mm -hmm. we got them to give us thirty recruits by linking up with USAID. And we said, hey, if you volunteer for this police program, we will teach you how to read and write for free. Mm -hmm. And everybody was all about that. So they came, learned to read and write. We built a compound on our fire base. We could have a partner for us. We trained them there. And then that became what was called the Ghazni Special Response Team. And they, they ended up calling them the Dirty 30. They had to disband them in 2010 because all a bunch of Hazaras and they, they got a little bit too pyro. They were just out there like swacking mm -hmm. Taliban, like <laughs> left and right. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a cool program to build because it was two young NCOs that conceptualized mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And the team leadership, like, that's awesome. Run with it. Mm -hmm. And we, everybody supported it. And then it was a very effective Are we still, unit. Are we talking... 05 or 06? This now? is 07, I think. 07. Maybe 06. It was pretty 06, yeah. 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 We came back from yep. 05. Iraq in mm -hmm. like December 05, maybe. And mm -hmm. then it was like June. I don't know when it was next. The next year we deployed to Afghanistan yeah. again. Yeah. Um, yeah, another good Green Beret one. Talk to me about the Afghan militia, police. The AMP? Uh, AMF? Uh, whatever, whatever, whatever those early units were. Yeah, the militia. What was their force. motivation? Were, Revenge, money, I think it was mostly patriotism. Money, to be honest with was you, was it? Yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit of patriotism because most of them can seem to truly hate the Taliban. Mm -hmm. But you know, we were paying them pretty well, right? Yeah, I mean, to us, it was like I'm only paying this guy hundred bucks. Yeah. but to them, it was like wow, it was. And we were providing food for them. Yeah, and they got weapons and ammunition and training, and they got I think more so maybe even power, right? Because then they were like the big dogs in the valley yeah. and they could do whatever they wanted. Yeah. Right? So yeah. maybe that was mm -hmm. the point, but they were loyal to a T. They were. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it was, if really you can trace back when we started hitting all the big problems in Afghanistan, and I could be off with this, is when we demobilized them and took all their weapons and now we had all these people that we had trained yeah. who were intimately aware of our tactics. Mm -hmm. Six months later is when we started hitting all the IDs mm -hmm. and really all the ambushes against us started ramping up, right? Mm -hmm. if you can... You can look at all the SIG acts, and that's when it really started ramping up. Because what are they going to do? They don't have any. We're not paying them anymore. We're telling them, okay, good job. Go find a job. Yeah. They're going to go find a job. Mm -hmm. And they're probably going to do what they're good at, which yeah. is fighting more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I could be wrong about it, that. It, that's just my theory. Yeah. It. Um, yeah. At that point, we stopped paying them the good American wage mm -hmm. and start like, paying them. It's the same in Iraq, right? At a certain point, you got to take that. that 
American oversight and kind of let them run with it, yeah. but then their pay goes down and they're all like, we well, even them like we didn't even find a different job. We said, okay, guys, yeah. AMF's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good luck. I, I was going to talk about this later because this is something you deal with at the NCO Academy. How do we manage these lessons learned over decades? How oh, do we, we suck how do we train? We're terrible at it, right? So how do we train? Unless we institutionalize some of these things in schooling, we forget because when when we were in SUT together, we ran we. They brought up somebody from uh, the Fort Benning Infantry School and they ran a tactics certification mm -hmm. course for like a week or two weeks. And you were the distinguished honor grad and I was the honor grad, right? And they gave us these books called uh, The Bear Went Over the Mountain yeah. and The Other Side of the Mountain. Yeah, and great they were, books. They were, yeah, they were written about that. Hard the, to read, but great books. Hard to read, great books. It's funny to read them later on now when you're like, I was in that same ambush yeah. point as the Russians, right? So... And, and Afghanistan's weird because it's there's so few roads, especially early on, that, that you kind of have to go. But we drove into the same ambush points as the Russians over and over and over again. And I, I just don't think, and I don't know if any military is, is good at harnessing lessons, lessons learned so you don't have to learn them in blood again. But all these things you've learned over the last 20 years, how do we harness that so the next generation of guys... I think it's hard to come to that mindset because... We do solidify a lot of these lessons learned in doctrine, right? But now, yeah. soft, you, you always have the, oh, we don't. Nobody we do reads that. doctrine. We, we operate outside the box. Like, yeah. But yeah. you still got to know what's in the box. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't be unconventional if you don't know how to be conventional, yeah. right? You have to know how to be conventional. But I, I just, I, I always I, fear I, this, that. The Center for Army's Lessons Learned used to put out good products. I don't know if they still do. Yeah. But then it's again, like, how do you get people to read that? You have to how read do you get it. people to consolidate it and then learn? Because it just seems. You know, unless it's going to look good on a one-year OER, like yeah. people don't even... Like, I don't unless you make videos that are really, really interesting. I, like I, when I was the first learner at, at uh, WLC, I w had an account at the call, right? The con Center for Army, and I read AARs, and they weren't easy to read. <gasps> no, they're and poorly was, written, but they're good uh, information. They are. They absolutely are, but... I don't know. Obviously, it's the schoolhouse's job to well, harness... Sometimes I don't think we want it. I mean... This will probably come back to bite me in the ass, but recently I sat down with the SMA of the Army, uh, Grinston, and he had a bunch of soft people in the room. And, it, and this is just the way I felt. Maybe I could be taking this wrong, but it felt like the narrative is, is, well, we did the best we could, and we didn't make any mistakes. Like, look, we can't say that yeah. we didn't. And I'm just saying, like, the pullout, or the, or the withdrawal. Yeah. But if we go all the way back, the way we screwed that up, I mean, yeah. it's almost as if we did the exact same things in Vietnam. Absolutely. Right? So, Absolutely it is. Um, we... we like, it's so funny because in Vietnam, they had the, uh, they called them, like they took the villages and they secured them and they moved everybody into them. That's the VSO project, right? It's the exact same thing. Um, and it didn't work in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And it failed in Afghanistan for the same reasons. It's like we're, we'll pull up the old playbook and let's yeah. go back to the first page. Um, there was some really creative things done in Afghanistan by Army, by Air Force, by everybody, right? Um, but there was... If you can't admit that you made mistakes, mm -hmm. the Taliban own Afghanistan. Yeah. So saying that we didn't make mistakes is complete BS. Obviously, yeah. we did. We did something, right? Yeah. But I think that, and I could be wrong. This is my theory, right? And I think this is why we continually screw this up is with the American mindset and our lack of patience. We always try to apply mm -hmm. a Western solution mm -hmm. to an, another country's problems. And if you look at Afghanistan and the Middle East and all those countries over in the general area, their timeline and progression for how they want to want to move towards any kind of progressive policy mm -hmm. is slower than ours. If you look at even why the Russians failed there, it's because every time they they tried to promote uh, some kind of a policy that was more progressive than uh, the people with power there that were religious mm -hmm. wanted, that's when it all went to shit. Like, nope, that's not what yeah. we're doing in this country. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we have to accept that if we keep trying to put western solutions on mm -hmm. the problems for these countries at, a, at the pace that we want to go to yeah. right it would mm -hmm. probably take that country 20 30 years to get into where we want to yeah but if we allow them to to make their own decisions mm -hmm. and policies it probably worked better than we, we basically gave them this corrupt government that they couldn't get behind anyway right? yeah and nobody yeah. could get behind it we couldn't mm -hmm. even get behind it now no so and then like oh well they gotta want it they gotta want this corrupt government that you forced on them more than you want it yeah like, no man come on like we did fuck that up like, uh, the, the, the local leader in a village in afghanistan who's paying taxes to a corrupt government in Kabul when he could pay money to the Taliban and actually get something in return, yeah, get protection. they're going to have a court when they need yeah, to. Yeah, it's just, it's a failure to look at that 
and put it, like you said, an American solution on a, on a Middle Eastern problem. And, and we've made the mistake over and over and over again. And uh, No, you guys are going to love this. You guys need F-16. <laughs> well, first of all, you got to give people what's sustainable, right? Like, yeah. Give mm-hmm. them something sustainable that they can yeah. sustain without these expensive contracts after yeah. you leave. And maybe that sticks and stones, but mm-hmm. it's better than something that's going to fail. Yeah. I remember doing hitting targets in Iraq with Iraqis and they would steal everything on target, you know? And people would be losing their mind. I'd be like, stop, look, this is part of the culture. This is a terrorist house. Take the money, I don't care. Just don't take the intel. Don't take his phone and CDs and stuff I need for intel. You want to steal his shit? I don't care. It's part of the fucking yeah. culture, you know? It is, right? <laughs> it is, like, yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. maybe, well, it's a corrupt culture. Like, yeah, but that's how they are. And it's, it's, it's you're, not gonna, you're not gonna go there and give them a lecture and have them not be that way. No, they're not. It's just, it, it, it's funny. It's an interesting conversation. Um, okay, so... At the end of that trip, anything significant on that trip, or was that was the Gosney trip? Yeah, I mean it was fun. Had the, had the rules of engagement, like when we were there in 04, right? It was one way, right? And then it it you've seen it fluctuate. Yeah, the rules are different. Like now, if you want to go out, you had to have a, you know, now we had Sipper, right? You had a connectivity. Yeah, I think that yeah. that was really one of our our biggest downfalls. Is now everybody want to know what you're doing, yeah. so you got to mm-hmm. spend time doing a thirty page, you know, PowerPoint presentation if you wanted to go out, which whatever. But then the rules did significantly change as mm-hmm. far as violence of action, what you could and couldn't mm-hmm. do, and what they were allowing operations. And, you know, the bigger picture I didn't see to that point as a, as a young well, E7. It's hard, so. Chuck, it's hard to see the big picture, right? I had this conversation with my warrant officer in um, Iraq because we were putting charges on doors and, bre- and blowing the doors and going in. And he was like, look, we need to not be explosively breaching because we're turning people against us. And yeah. I'm like, okay, I agree with that. And it's probably a good um, path, but I'm the guy standing at the breach point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's safer for me to blow that door and get yeah. in quickly. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to go home in a couple yeah. of months, right? So I don't have the luxury to see the big picture mm-hmm. right now. I'm just trying to make it through the next mission. Yeah. So it's kind of, I, I, I get the point. I really yeah. do. Dropping bombs and, and, and a lot of times that is very, it turns people against you if you're mm-hmm. too heavy handed. The Brits did it in Northern Ireland for freaking decades, right? Um, and it's fun when you're on the ground doing it, right? <laughs> <laughs> you said the loud part, part the quiet part out loud. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, so that Gosney trip. Anything significant? I mean, it was a it was a great trip. It was how long you know, was it? Uh, it was seven months. But I just mm-hmm. think that that it was a really good Green Beret trip because you got to build something from nothing, mm-hmm. and it was something that was enduring. And even way after the fact, you'd run into some of these guys and they're like, "Man, I really appreciate learning how to read and write." Mm-hmm. And then I had this job that paid me more than the rest of the police, and I and I was able to do something that I felt was really beneficial. So and that I, that's, I that was cool. So that's two thousand four to two thousand six. And that's probably through out of three out of two years, you're probably deployed eighteen months out of two years, right there, right? And even when you're home, you're off doing your Griffin Group, or you your Mid South, mm-hmm. or you're this, doing some kind of did, training where you're not home. Did this start wearing on you yet? Uh, I didn't think it did. Yeah, right? but also, but in hindsight, went through a divorce at that point in time. Right, yeah. you know, it's. Mm-hmm. In hindsight, yeah, I, I, it does wear on you. Mm. It's, it's so funny, and, and it's not funny, but in, in the Q course back then, it was six phases, right? Mm-hmm. And they used to say phase seven was divorce. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, because the job suffers last, mm-hmm. right? You just keep going and keep going, and you feel that obligation that you're doing great things, and you are. But I just want like that's that's two years there with probably four or five months home, mm-hmm. and when you're home, you're training, 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 training to yeah. go back. Um, Okay, so you come back from that trip, a mm. couple of months? Yeah, a couple of months, and then back again to Afghanistan. And that okay. time we go up to Kabul, and it was my first time up. No, I'm sorry, no, that was, that was down south again. This was Kandahar, because this was where I got blown up. Mm. Um, yeah, and that trip was just wild. I mean, we got out to the fire base, and the next day we went out to the district center where the Brits were holed up, and it looked like somebody had a call of duty. It was this structure with Hescos and sandbags and machine guns pointing out every window in the structure. We just shot up and blown up. And the British are like, yeah, mate, you missed it two days ago. You know, the Taliban almost overrun us. They, you they, started with the Brit action, then you, then you aborted it. Uh, Come on, do I the Brit action. I can't do the Brit action. I don't Come know on. It was like more of an Australian accent. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, mate. Uh, 
And he was like, yeah, you said they destroyed buildings. We just had to drop bombs on a 360 around us for a couple hours, and the enemy got so close we couldn't even depress the machine guns anymore. I forgot what they called the 50 cals. They called it... Uh, 0.5. Yeah. 0.5. He's like, we, mm-hmm. couldn't de- we couldn't depress the 0.5s anymore. And uh, we basically just had a hole up, and it was like the Alamo. And I was like, damn. Holy crap. Like, and I was like, that's crazy. He's like, yeah. hey, that's just normal. He's like, you'll see. Yeah. And for real, with the fire basically hit every night. And we knew every time we left the wire, somebody was going to die. Were you close to the border? No, you in Canada? No, this was this no. was uh, in Helmand Province at the top of the river, oh, the Helmand okay. River. And it was yeah. just nasty, mm-hmm. um, super nasty. Had Helmand Province been neglected at, up to that point, and then that was where they pushed back into it? Was that that time? Yeah, or was I that remember. I know time, the Brits yeah. had been up there for a minute. Yeah, they'd uh, gotten a lot of gunfights up but there. But you had a choice going up to the fire base of taking the road by the river, which you knew you were going to get jacked up on, mm-hmm. or you could take the desert. Uh, between that and the mountains. And what's cool is us that trip, we took the UAE with us. So, okay, talking about being home, we had to go to the UAE for three months and train up their soft with them really? before that deployment. And then we deployed with them. Mm. And, and one of their princes or shakes, whatever, given us this badass shower trailer. Because there's no showers up there. Yeah, I got hit with an ID on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> like, no! Hit the ammunition truck. You don't hit the shower. And they filled the shower with all our MREs, too. So they had the shower stack from top to bottom with all our food. So that got and hit an up. ID? Yeah. The only wow. way to resupply yourself there was to take these 100-vehicle jingle truck convoys up there mm-hmm. like once a month. And you knew you were going to lose about 10 of them yeah. every single time. Yeah. This is the, 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 Those jingle trucks, if you look them up, they're... Uh, they're they're big trucks with all this glitter, all this yeah. bling on them, and they're like not made for four by four travel, <laughs> and they break down like crazy. And then they they use band aids and, and and glue and, and and tape to fix how them. they made them work. Like, I don't God, know. they did, they did. Um, but there was so that trip, you, we were going out one day to escort the other team down to the highway, and uh, we knew something was every something bad happened every time we went out. Like, yeah, right, well, we're just. Hoping, you you know, just have that feeling. You're like, oh, this is going to be bad. Yeah. So we get out, and we're about an hour into escorting them down south, and I'm on the rear truck on the Mark 19. I'm facing the rear point security, and you go boom. I look over my shoulder. I can see our lead truck is just in a cloud of, of dust. And this, I think, this is a good example of everything you not to do. And le- le- lessons learned later, what you don't do is if you hit an ID, you don't run up to the vehicle. Because um, I told our JTAG, like, you take the gun. I'm running up there. I didn't even asked for permission. It's kind of dumb. I should have stayed back, pulled security, mm-hmm. ran to the truck to help out. Did you take the JTAC out of the fight by putting him on the gun? No, you no. Know? We, he, we, he had, couldn't... we had two JTACs. Okay, there. yeah. And then, so, and he ended up switching out with somebody else anyway. So, anyway, should have done that anyway. Should have mm-hmm. put the JTAC on Well, I've the seen that before. I've seen the medic on the gun. And I'm like, why is the medic on the gun? Yes. We need him. Like, he can't leave the gun. Stupid anyway, go on. Yeah. And then run up there. And the gunner had been blown out all the way in front of the vehicle. A guy named Ezell Brown went up to him. I'm like, He's uh, what are you doing? He's he's like dragging himself. He's like Chuck, Chuck. I think my legs are blown off. I look and his legs are there. And I'm like, so I, you know, do my checks. So like Boogie, you got no no blood. He's like, really? So he just stands up. He like dusts himself. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> he's like, thanks, Chuck. I appreciate it. I'm like, <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, he's in shock, probably. Yeah, yeah. I run up and the. <clears throat> it's lucky you weren't lying to him. You're like, no, you're good. And he's trying to stand <laughs> up. Yeah. One of the guys that was in the back got blown out. He was our um, 18 Fox, and uh, I couldn't find anything wrong with me. He's like, he's like, all oh, this stuff hurts, but he's wearing Gore-Tex. So, you know, if, if I could do this again, I would have cut his Gore-Tex off and checked because he actually mm-hmm. bleeding out pretty well from his arm. His arm was shattered. Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't catch that. I, I think I gave him a morphine injection and told him, like, hey, just sit tight. Just suck it up. Um, mm-hmm. And this time other people were mm-hmm. coming up. Like, my dumb ass shouldn't have ran up there. Like, Did you guys uh, stop right inside you pull up behind the lead vehicle getting hit? We, no, they still kept the distance, but there were IEDs all around this vehicle. Yeah, they were that became a drugs. very common TTP yeah. later on, right? Luckily, yeah. mm-hmm. those were all set to a pressure plate, mm-hmm. um, but if they had them set for a manual deck, like, mm-hmm. we would have been screwed. Yeah, uh, But we had this, this crazy team starting that was with us, and he was up there. He was like, I got this. He's in there with his knife just digging at it. I'm like, what the hell is going on? But our dog handler was in the back, and he didn't get blown out. And the, the IED had, had created... Or it basically made the bottom of the vehicle a claymore device. So it, all the metal cut through both of his legs and both of his arm, arteries were cut. He was cut through multiple places in his arms. And when we pulled him out of the vehicle, he had bled out so much in that short amount of time that it had dripped down and then made a like a little river of blood all the way to the front of the vehicle. So we pulled mm-hmm. him off. He's cut in the face. And we're working on him. And his crotch is blown up. And you know, he's bleeding out of his crotch. He's stuffing that with gauze. And even with all the tourniquets, he was still bleeding. And uh, I mean... 
we didn't get him stabilized there, but he was still alive. We got him on the bird. He died on mm -hmm. the way there, but mm -hmm. but he, he was he was pretty jacked up. His mm -hmm. dog survived. I think his dog went to to his family, but that was pretty wild. Mm -hmm. But here's another lesson learned from that trip. So we were going out on the vehicles, and it was it was like cold. Right? It was like 28 degrees at night. Everybody's like, "What are you doing, Chuck? Why are you packing your rucksack? It's going to be like a four-hour mission." I'm like, "Man, if you're on a vehicle, always pack for three mm -hmm. days because it's that you can put your ruck on the yep. outside of the vehicle. And There's no downside to having it." Yep. One of our other senior weapons guy, a guy named Kern Brown, he's like, "This sounds like a stupid I know him. Chuck. You know Kern, mm -hmm. yeah." But in the morning, guess what? I saw Kern doing <laughs> packing his packing his his rucksack. Yeah. So me and Kern were the only ones that had our stuff packed. Yeah. And then after that, we were stuck out there for a couple of days, yeah. right? Yeah. Because then we had to escort the team down. And it was cold, and we were the only ones with a sleeping bag yep. mm -hmm. and other stuff. And after that, I was like, yeah, it's a good idea. Every time you go out on a mission. Yeah. yeah. But back to the ID, like the lesson learned there was you don't ever just run up to that site. The first thing you do is pull security. Mm -hmm. and maybe you're going to have buddies that are bleeding out. But if somebody would have detonated those other IDs, they would have smoked mm -hmm. half the half the formation right there. Yeah. So you got to get that security, and you got you to clear up. And then try to pull the guys off the edge mm -hmm. if you can, right? Yeah, it's human nature to try and get in there and help very, very quickly. Yeah. But you can make the situation worse. Yep. Yeah. And we'd even practice the way to do it properly. Yeah. So I don't know why. Like, But the first time it happens for rigor, like mm. all that stuff. You know, like for mm. me, it went out the window. Other people were yelling at me, telling me I was an idiot too. Mm -hmm. um, after the fact, though, yeah, it was pretty mm -hmm. stupid. Like, okay. That was pretty dumb. So what, one, one KIA? So that was one K in that one. Um, the guy who got blown out, who thought he was, we seen the turret? Yeah. yeah the guy, Ezel Brown. Yeah, he was jacked up. In the head. We had a meta back him too, because I look over and he's like, Chuck, I'm cutting all this stuff out of the vehicle. I'm like, Boogie, off the top of the vehicle. He's all like waving around. Yeah, and you know. I'm like, Boogie, we're just going to mm -hmm. blow it up. Like, get off. He's like, yeah. oh, my God. He had, all these, he had like all these radios in his arms and yeah, stuff. I'm yeah. like, Boogie, man, get out of there. <laughs> get, on that, get on the meta back bird. Did he, he recovered, obviously, right? He just uh, got rattled. He got rattled pretty mm -hmm. hard. And the other guy didn't come back. But then on our way back to the firebase the next day, um, we had another couple IEDs, and that one killed a bunch of our Afghans and, mm -hmm. and jacked up a bunch of those guys. Mm -hmm. And another lesson learned here, I, I was up to, on one, and his leg was shattered. I was like, all right, I got this, man. I'm going to take these pieces of, of wood from this crate over here, and I'm going to make a splint for him. So I put the splint on there as I'm wrapping. He's like, ah! I'm like, stop. Like, He's like, ah! And somebody else is like, no, no, Chuck. Like, you didn't take the nails out of the crate board. So I was putting the nails into his <laughs> leg. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> hey, lessons learned. Take the nails out. Uh, so um, I, got a, I got his leg wrapped up. But. That's awesome. Uh, again, we get back from that, that mission. And just to give a context of how crazy that that whole trip was it was so normal to get attacked at the fire base all the time so we started out just living in this tent and there wasn't even a wall around this place that in fact the second day we got there i was taking a dump in this giant ass hole and all of a sudden all this machine gun fire started coming over right so then i'm like on the ground like trying to get poop in my leg i'm like <laughs> i was like what's going on it's like i'm gonna die <laughs> Right, <laughs> like this can't be it. I gotta, I gotta, this, I gotta wipe before I die. I gotta do it because we talked to the team we'd ripped out. We're like, well, what you guys doing? All these rockets that were coming. It's like, oh, we're just getting the connects. Like, it's not gonna stop anything, right? Mm -hmm. But dude, there was nothing else out there at the time, so we yeah. finally built Huskos. And stuff were you in there. low ground with with no elevated positions around you? Like some no, of the we fire were in, like, bases, the I was worst like, position. Who put this? We here? were right on the, the river too, so they would just sneak up the river and shoot at us. Yeah, but at some point we we ended up air dropping a bunch of lumber in and getting some engineers up there. They started building us these bee huts. And uh, we got these air conditioner units in finally because we didn't have anything at that point mm -hmm. in time. And these we got these Chigos and me and What's our Chigos. A Chigo is like the it's like the ductless air conditioners that you always have downrange. Mm -hmm. They have the external unit and it's got the stuff inside yeah. to where mm -hmm. it's like the little like the little white vent you see it in like if you look at any movie from Middle Eastern countries, mm -hmm. it's the AC unit yeah. they use, right? Mm -hmm. um, so me and my buddy, the other Bravo, we're hooking up one of these Chigos and we go down and we start unpackaging it. And the firefight starts around the fire base. And it's like 6 o'clock, still light. I'm like, all right, that doesn't sound too bad. This is normal, right? So let's just go finish hooking this Chigo. We don't need, need to get our gear down. As, mm -hmm. we, as we're walking up the hill, this Chigo starts getting more and more intense. And all of a sudden, mortars start coming in. We're like, probably about 10 more minutes before we, like, it's bad. So let's just keep hooking up the Chigo. And all of a sudden, it was like, boom. And this something came in, and it was huge. We're like, yo, are they shooting school buses at us now? <laughs> and they'd set up these 105s. The same thing there yeah. that we were talking mm -hmm. about in the Bravo course. They had the same thing. Mm. Um, they weren't even spigs. They were just like, I don't know where they got these things from. They were, mm. for all, like, they look like an American-made recoilless rifle, or whoever made that recoilless rifle. And they are hitting us from this compound about 1,000 meters. So then we got our stuff on, and we brought mm -hmm. our heavy weapons to the... 
the wall, but it was so normal at that point in time for that for those type of things. I was like, okay, we don't need to get our kid on. Like, this is a normal. Mm. There's they're just hitting checkpoint yeah. two, or they're Sporadic. doing this, and it wouldn't even spread. They're pretty well aimed. Like, yeah. but we just like okay, at this point, the Brits are going to flex here, and this is going to happen, and the UAE is going to go here. So we got to. You know, we got a couple minutes before we need to get our history. It's just nor- like it shouldn't be that normal. No, right? it shouldn't. But it does get normal after yeah. a while. Did you build the base defense plan for that? Because you're the senior Bravo right now. Yeah, and you're so, building that. So base for def- our section, yeah. yeah, and it was it's pretty cool because we did tie it into the base defense plan for the company that was on the southern edge, and they they did have a high ground position over all this low ground. Yeah, and the enemy made a mistake one time of of trying to mass and come through there and the. The company mm. sergeant major just calling AC-130 Spectre, nice. just annihilating those yeah. guys. Because yeah. the rest of the force was was up um, west of Sangi and doing a clearance operation. They're like, oh, nobody's at the fire base. But there were mm. some people still at the fire base, mm-hmm. and they just yeah. laid away. B- building that base defense plan in remote locations. Now now you've done it a couple of times. And yeah. By the time you got there, you're sure like, okay, now yeah. this is what they didn't teach me on the Bravo course that I mm-hmm. now know because I've done it a couple of times. Yeah. Like machine guns here, sectors of fire, yeah. gun trucks. Yeah, all Fall that. Fall back positions, and you rehearse it. Yeah. And you rehearse mm-hmm. it until everybody knows where they're going. That's how. Yeah. That's why right. we thought we had time. We're like, okay. Like once, because we'd have a radio. Once it comes to the radio for whatever the code was, you know, then we were launched to our positions, which yeah. we didn't have to do because the code was the big rounds coming in. Like, okay, now it's, mm, it's time to get serious. Yeah, and people, people for young 18 Bravos out there, the, the rehearsals are key. The, mm-hmm. the, the, the base defense plan on a piece of paper or a PowerPoint means nothing mm-hmm. unless you rehearse it and rehearse over it and, and rehearse again. it. Yeah, you know exactly where you're going. You exactly. know, how to tie yeah. in. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. Um, all right, so uh pretty wild trip huh so uh, yeah and then about halfway through that trip so i went home for the birth of my son in um december came back in january and about two weeks after i came back they said hey you're gonna go down to kandahar we've got the the first ever mine resistant vehicles that we're getting in country you're gonna gonna get the first classes on them Mm -hmm. you're gonna bring them back to the fire base right and they this is open source but they had a v-ship hole to deflect the the improvised explosive device um at that point we lost a ton of vehicles at the fire base to ieds we didn't take i love the gmvs and the humvees i think it's an excellent design but you know it it doesn't stand up well to an explosion or anything Mm -hmm. even even your smaller devices are gonna are gonna crumple those things yeah Mm -hmm. so you went down to get trained on so we trained up for a week Mm -hmm. on these these vehicles and when we came back, we are going to bring this this convoy of jingle trucks with us because that's what you did. But it was the first time we were bringing these trucks back to back to the fire base. And we had never been hit on the hardball road. From Kandahar mm-hmm. up until the point to where you turned north in the fire base, we had never been hit, right? So mm-hmm. I think we may, may be a little bit too complacent there. Mm-hmm. We didn't rehearse any reaction drills of what would happen on the, on the hardball. Yeah. And then these vehicles, you're, you're strapped in like some kind of fighter jet like or like a helicopter. It's like this six-point harness system and... And I was gunning on our vehicle. I was I was a gunner in a fifty cal inside. And were you out of the vehicle? Or no, no, you, you're inside. So you're, these were the new no. ones. They had a screen in yep. front of you. Had a joystick. Uh, the, yeah, crow system. Yeah, mm-hmm. crow system. First thing we first time we'd ever use these mm-hmm. things. Um, and we'd hook up this badass radio, like this sound system in the vehicle. So we're jamming out. <laughs> so in our vehicle, our was our senior engineer that was driving. Our captain was in the the TC seat or the truck commander position, and I was right behind the driver. And then right next to me was our JTAC, who, you know, mm-hmm. we were always in the vehicle together. Like, me and me and him were... So JTAC is Air Force, yeah, and he, Air Force he joined Patrol. Terminal Attack. Um, he drops the bombs, right? Yep. He's the guy that, that communicates with the aircraft. Yep. I'm just explaining it for yep. people who don't know. Yep. So he's got his little system in there. He's working next to me, and, and next to him is our, our junior engineer. Uh, I'm sorry to say engineers. Our senior combo guy that was driving. So as we're driving, I didn't have my, my chest harness on it. And I don't think anybody did, to be did honest that, with you. Did that save your life? Well, because what in hell? We'll, 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 we'll get to all that. I had was my lap belt mm-hmm. on. Okay. Um, so we're driving, and we're probably twenty miles west of Kandahar. And the next thing I know, it's it's smoky, um, halfway upside down. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And nothing's really. I don't really. I don't really remember anything well until I was in the helicopter. But I remember the captain saying, "Chuck, I think Bill's dead." And then um, next thing I know, I was getting dragged out of the vehicle. But what had happened is we'd come over a culvert, and they had about 500 pounds of explosive under this thing. And I mm. picked the vehicle up, threw it about 50, 60 meters down the road, and it was facing the opposite way. Mm. And you couldn't even tell it was a vehicle at that point. But it but killed, it, the, killed it, the driver instantly. Was it still upright? 
No, it was on its, it was it's kind of like half on, on its side, half okay. on its top. Yeah. Uh, so it killed the driver instantly. Uh, the The captain it had broke the, all the seats in the front, so his back was broken, so he couldn't move. And then it killed the JTEC right next to me, killed him instantly. And for me, I'd smashed into that screen for the gun. I'd smashed that in half with my face. Yeah. And then I'd hit, there was a, for whatever reason they made this vehicle, there was a bolt up top. And the only thing that saved my life there is I had my helmet on, but I didn't have the chin strap on. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't going to put the chin strap on. I wasn't going to put my my other harness on until we hit the, the what we call the road of death, going right. up to the fire. Because yeah. we knew we were going to get hit then with something. Yeah. But it didn't even, didn't even cross my mind that we mm-hmm. could get on the highway. Uh, so that, sm- that gave me about, I forgot, it was like between seven and eight skull fractures. It completely destroyed my, my nose and the front part of my, my like, the viewers can't see. But if you look closely, there's a scar that goes from the top of my forehead all the way down my nose and down all that was rebuilt over the course of four years. Mm -hmm. And then where the joystick was for the gunner's uh, weapon system, the Mm -hmm. weapon system that hit my leg and it completely tore all those muscles in my leg right there, broke a bunch of ribs. And then I remember on the helicopter, like flying, I felt somebody next to me and I was like slapping their face. And it was the junior engineer that was in the back. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, Josh, is that you? He's like, yeah. He's like, hey, man, I think they got some boots tied to my head. And they tied, like, they put these boots as, like, a neck brace that they had tied around his neck yeah, and his head. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that sounds like it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but I had the exact same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, um, was it the medics on site that treated you guys? So, yeah. So, uh, actually, the the guy, one of the guys that pulled me out of the vehicle, two people pulled me out of the vehicle, a guy named Kern Brown, and we talked about previously, and a guy named Dan Adams. Mm-hmm. And Dan Adams was our senior medic. I know Dan. Yeah, and then he died. He died. I didn't um, know he died until I saw it on the internet. He was on the Bravo course. He was on the yeah, Q course with us. Yeah. yeah. A great soldier. Yeah, great awesome. He went over to, soldier. yeah. yeah. He, he went, he left third group, and then he was a team sergeant, and then he died in an ambush. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Or really a nasty mm-hmm. ambush. Uh, pretty close to Gosney, where we were the trip before mm-hmm. that. Uh over near FOB Airborne. But anyway, so they, they, they pulled us out, and then it took them hours to get the captain out of there because the seats were broken, his back was broken, they knew how to get him out. It's not like you can cut into an armored vehicle either, no. and, and like you can a car, right? Yeah. That, that, yeah. Um, and those doors and even the hatches are super heavy, yeah. right? Yeah. When it's on its side, yeah. lifting that thing upwards, mm-hmm. it, it's not designed for that, right? No. Yeah. So, um, th- so did, did they send like a, a medevac bird and search and rescue unit? Because... That's kind of their thing is, is mm-hmm. search and rescue to come cut into the vehicle, but not an armored vehicle. But. No, they didn't get them out. But the, our lead vehicle also had an idea. It blew their mine roller off their vehicle, so they were yeah. stuck a little bit way up the road. Was it command detonated? Uh, Did we, we think know? it was. Yeah. And within 100 meters of the site was a pretty large police station. Uh, okay. So yeah, And all the cops right. are just sitting there looking, mm-hmm. seeing what's going yeah, on, right? Yeah, yeah. They're like, okay, here to come. Boom, right? Fingers in the ear. Yeah. There's no way you're going to put that much explosive in a culvert nobody's gonna know no that. no right yeah so. um so uh so you actually when you hit and you flipped you you blacked out and you remember being on your side that was the next recollection yeah. i remember well i remember it just being really smoky and just i couldn't see and feel i just remember the captain saying asking me if i was okay saying that he doesn't think bill made it and then i don't i remember Sitting up against the Humvee, maybe I don't know if this memory is made up or not. I remember like bleeding out of my mouth, talking about stupid hobbies or something. I don't mm-hmm. remember. And uh, I remember the medics saying, "Oh yeah, this guy's like jacked up in the head." And then the next rule, I remember being on the helicopter, and then I remember being in Kandahar Airfield, and this dude was trying to give me an IV. Some some NATO dude, mm-hmm. and I was getting he's like jabbing me, and I was getting pissed. I remember grabbing his hands like I'll do it myself. <laughs> and then they held me down, and, yeah. and they got me. But I remember. Uh, at one point, I woke up and they were stitching up my my head. They're like, "Hey, man, you know, we gave you a local anesthetic. Just relax." And yeah. They were they were stitching up a lot of the stuff in my face, and then yeah. You if know, you had no helmet on, you probably would die, right? If I know, yeah, I would definitely yeah. have been dead. Because yeah. I still got the helmet to this day, mm-hmm. and where the screw hit the top of the helmet is a deep hole, mm-hmm. and it goes all the way down the back. Send me a picture, will you? Yeah. Take a picture when you get home. Yeah. I I look. I I've done it, and you've done it. I've driven around in. Afghanistan and Iraq with no helmet on, like a jackass with a baseball cap. And if you're in a vehicle, there's no excuse not to have your gear on. You're not running across the mountains. There's, you're, you're and I, again, I've done it myself. Put your damn helmet on. There's yeah. really, there's no excuse not to be kitted up as much as possible yeah. in That's a probably would save that guy that got blown out of the, the turret, that he's bringing his helmet on, right? Yeah. And if he didn't have his helmet on, he probably would have been, because when, yeah. when I got to him, his helmet was all like jacked up and mm-hmm. stuff. But I mean, Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Recovery. So I, 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 
like I said at the start, I saw you, I don't know how long after that, where your teeth were all jacked up and mm-hmm. everything, and you were still pretty rattled from that. Mm-hmm. How long did the recovery really take? So it took four years, but after two years, I snuck into a, a combat deployment. How many, how many surgeries in two years? Mm-hmm. So you had nine skull fractures? Yeah, well, <laughs> seven, between seven and eight, I think. Okay, um, your so teeth were gone? Front teeth were gone, and the mm-hmm. whole jaw up here was destroyed. So mm-hmm. I came back, and they... They started working on the nose and they're working on the upper part of my, my face here. And really the, the whole jaw area is what took the long. So they had to do a bunch of bone grafts and they had to cultivate bone from the bottom. And that they're still like, if you really look close, my jaw's still off because they were supposed to go back in there and, and reset it to where it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. But I just didn't, I mean, I had 17 surgeries in my mouth and jaw. I was pretty much done with them. Yeah. Like, no, it's, it's what it is. Yeah. Um, but they did a pretty good job of yeah closing all this yeah stuff until right. you said it i didn't even notice it you know yeah there are some screws in there. there's one on my left side right here and i don't know if it's loose or if it's just on a nerve but when i anytime i run anytime i run i can i can see my my pulse in my left eye and maybe it's just something weird with a nerve yeah um but it gives me headaches sometimes really weird i've gotten used to it but i can yeah. tell like what if i'm i'm like stressing out because I, I i think i can see my pulse i don't know if i really can but it, yeah. it, it, it feels real weird yeah um cognitive stuff from that like that is your head is not supposed to get jarred like that yeah that was that was pretty big so i had to go to cognitive therapy pretty much right away because i couldn't think and i became real dyslexic so before that one of my claims to fame in the q course was that i could i could look at a one over fifty thousandths map for about five ten minutes i would never i could go 12 15 kilometers however i would never have to look at the map again Mm -hmm. because i could just remember and visualize it somehow Mm -hmm. couldn't do that after that Mm -hmm. i became dyslexic I couldn't think properly, couldn't speak properly, and it became really weird. In, so, in what way couldn't you speak properly? So even like we were talking before this episode started, podcasting helps me, even hosting a podcast, and I've, I've been invested in some public speaking lessons lately because I found that because my speech, it's not that I can't talk, it's like that the way the brain thinks doesn't work properly, so I'll get stuck up on words or I'll have to think about something mm-hmm. longer than I probably should have, or I, I just... It gets weirder. I'll say the same thing twice and not even realize it. Mm. So I realized that right away that things were backwards. And even to this day, like faces, facial recognition is something that even if I know you really well, it usually takes me about 30 to 60 seconds to recognize a person fully. Mm. What about names? If somebody says, do you know this guy? Nah, like that's sometimes it's not too bad. Mm -hmm. What I found though is if I do cognitive therapy and cognitive, cognitive therapy done properly sucks. They run you through all these drills. Did the Army do that or was it The Army did this. This is before we had the special operations Mm -hmm. programs. Yeah. uh, Which was, you know, it took me four years to recover from that. But when we had the programs, I recovered a lot faster because we are idiots with recovery, right? Like we convince ourselves that we're good. Mm -hmm. I remember one day I had a bone graft where they pulled out all my wisdom teeth. They cultivated bone from the bottom of my jaw and they did a bone graft up top and I had stitches in there. It was like a day or maybe the Two days after I come, my buddy's like, "Hey man, let's do a twelve mile rock march on mm. on uh, whatever that trail is over there in Rayford." And, mm-hmm. and then no, I was laid up for like three weeks after that. And it's one of the reasons why some of the screws are still messed up. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, uh, just stupid stuff like that. But cogn- the cognitive therapy stuff was really beneficial on it. And and you know, every couple of years, I think that if you've had TBI, you should do it because it runs you through it. it just force you to to think in a linear pattern. It's, it's almost like people will talk shit about MDMP or IPB. It's just it's just an algorithm that helps you think in a linear pattern, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing that complicated about it. Cognitive therapy does the same thing. They just it's really aggravating when mm. you do it, mm-hmm. but it helps a lot. Yeah, and, and, but it didn't help with the speech part. It helps more with the, the 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 being able to not have ADHD to the the level that we often do. Mm-hmm. Um, and they give you a lot of tools and habits to use that kind of counteract that. So mm. it's uh it's really cool that the army had that in place. Like the guys who got blown up really early in the war didn't get that, no, right? There was yeah. none of that in place. So um and their facility was pretty legit at that point in time. Yeah. Um, where, where was it? Was it, it was at Womack, Wo- yeah. Womack, okay. Yeah. Mm. And I was I was like, oh it's gonna be stupid because yeah. I, you know, I wasn't very impressed with Army medicine at that point. Yeah. That oral maxillofacial surgery did an excellent job in my face, right? Mm-hmm. But other stuff I'm like, okay, these guys are just Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um so physical surgeries yeah, so I, I really had to relearn how to walk again yeah. um, and then my ribs were all broken so that took luckily just so happened our battalion surgeon at the time was a, a chiropractor right and and you know i'm not sometimes i'm like eh, is chiropractor really a thing or not mm-hmm. but he was able to really help me through getting everything straightened back up in there and getting the ribs back in place because they were healing all weird mm. uh, so that was 
that was just by luck mm-hmm. that, that we were able to do that. Because I have problems breathing a lot. And he was like, oh, we can fix that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to suck, but we can yeah. fix it. And, and your leg good. injury, was that just rebuilding that? that was it actually... It was all the ligaments and tendons, and yeah. you could tell like there was a an empty space right there from the where the muscle was torn. Mm-hmm. Um, no surgeries on that, but just mm-hmm. physical therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, I don't know it was called physical therapy. I think it was just called um, what the hell did they call it? they call it something else. It wouldn't call physical therapy. It was like a, I don't know. Anyway, whatever mm-hmm. they're called at the time. I have TBI too, so I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> occupational therapy is what it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, going yeah. through that. Really, really helped a lot, and then I got to the point to where I was functional. So I snuck in a 2010 trip, mm-hmm. but during that trip, which is cool, we like Afghanistan. Our, yeah, our team was was responsible for building the Afghan National Army Special Forces team. They're like, again, they're like, figure it out. Mm-hmm. Like, this is what you need to do. So we yeah. got to build that program again, another enduring program that lasted forever. But near the end of that trip, the the battalion CSM pulled me aside. I was like, Chuck, he's like, you know how I know you haven't finished your surgeries? I was like, how? He's like, well, for one, you don't have any front teeth, right? <laughs> <laughs> but two. I called your surgeon, and they said, mm. no, you still got four surgeries left. Mm-hmm. And so here's, here's what's going to happen. I'm not going to mm. kick you out of this trip. When we get back, you're banned from deploying. And until I see a written letter from your surgeon and from your psychiatrist, mm-hmm. you can't. I'm not clearing you for duty. Mm-hmm. So, and, that's, and I don't know who that CSM was. It was, Eckert, but, it was Mark Ecker. Was it? Yeah. I was going to say he did not do that to cover his ass. He did that for your benefit. Oh, like yeah, he did. And that's, that's good leadership, right? Now, Mark Eckert's a phenomenal leader. We both work for him. Um, and he became the youth suck CSM. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that's cool. So you went back and you, you, you finished up. All the surgeries and so all that I finished stuff. finished them up, and then 2012, they're like, all right, you're ready to go. I, I went with a team to Tajikistan for a little bit. Mm-hmm. That was pretty cool because we were right on the other side of the Afghan border doing mm-hmm. really what they call the CNT, counter-narco-terrorism stuff, but really we're working with their KGB equivalent of people that were there to interdict the drugs on that side of the border. Mm-hmm. So that was just a pretty cool trip. And then the next trip was a team sergeant, and that's when we deployed, and that's the trip that I got shot up three times in Mm. to Gob Valley. Tell that story. So <laughs> we were at Camp Moorhead, Afghanistan, working with 6th Special Operations Kandak. And the Kandak's like a battalion. And the 6th Special Operations Kandak is responsible for the entire country. It's, it's their equivalent of Army Rangers. You know, not as proficient as Not Rangers, really, right? but I yeah. Mean, mm-hmm. There's probably nobody in the world that can do what Army Rangers mm-hmm. can do, right? Actually, there's, there's nobody, right? But anyway, so... But these guys are pretty good. Overall, two... Not maybe, anyway, we won't get into that. But mm-hmm. they're pretty good. They're yeah. okay. So we got told that, hey, you guys are going to, well, let me tell this whole story. I got a call at 10 o'clock at night. They're like, hey, Chuck, um, you guys are going to do this company level mission. I need your con out by 7 o'clock in the morning, right? And somebody's going to listen to this and probably get pissed. But I was like, okay. So we spent mm-hmm. all night doing this con op. Secret, secret document, right? Con op is just like an operations order. Yeah, it's, an abbreviated op- operation to let them know what you're going to do. Basically, it's a plan, right? right? Yeah, I think this one had to be like 64 mm-hmm. pages of oh, stuff. Oh, God. It was, it was huge. So in the morning, we have a video teleconference with the command. And the you first have, pages... A, I'm sorry. Do you have a captain? Yeah, yeah. Squared so away? All, yeah, he was badass. Good, like, so, yeah. so we all did this together. But in the morning, the, we have a brief. And the first slide says, how much planning have the Afghans done in this? It's like none, right? Because... Like, mm-hmm. So they call us right before the brief, like, "Hey, this isn't going to work. All right, you need you need to have Afghan involvement." It's like, well, "You just called me last night. You said you need this con up by nine o'clock in the morning. It's a secret document. I can't even. Sh- I don't, can't. They, mm-hmm. What are you talking about?" They're like, well, the boss isn't going to like this. I'm like, "What are you guys talking about?" Mm-hmm. Anyway, so we go to the brief, and they're like, "Hey, there's like 800 people in this valley." I'm like, "Okay." And they're like, "But you got a force ratio. You can only take one green brave for any ten Afghans." I'm like, "All right." So we plan this thing out. I'm like, "That's like." That's like 80 Afghans. There's like 88 you, people, I think, total on this mission. Real, real quickly, Chuck, explain why. Explain why there had to be Afghans involved and why the number... Because it's confusing for people who don't know. And if they don't know what Green Berets do, we, yeah. we, we're basically there to work ourselves out of a job yeah. and train these people. And the tendency for us is to maintain control and have less of yeah. them, right? Um, but that's not really what we're supposed to do. A, a good Green Beret on the ground is going to have more indige. Yeah. Know, even in Iraq, yeah. Mo- even as a young E6 and no interpreter, I'd have 10 to 20 Iraqis with me. And yeah. I have an interpreter, and I would corral those guys around the battlefield all day long. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and a 12 man ODA is supposed to be able to train, assist, advise, and accompany a battalion, yeah. right? So that's why. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they, they weren't forcing your hand to have more Afghan involvement just for some stupid reason. This is our job. This is what we do yeah. for a living. Okay, yeah. sorry. So go that's ahead. That's the mm-hmm. job because. 
you have all these other elements in special operations. You have Army Rangers, who we just hit on, and they will go in and strike any target mm-hmm. with a lot of ass, mm-hmm. and they will do it quickly, and, and they can hit a target and be out better than anybody else in the world. We got SEALs. They're also designed to be a, a very direct action asset. You got your special mission units, which are very surgical, very good at what they do. Mm-hmm. They can go in and out, and they can hit almost anything in a very politically sensitive environment. Um, but we're more of the dirty deeds done dirt cheap. Right? We're like, <laughs> you want... If That's you want, the best description of special forces like, I've yeah. ever heard. So, you know, we're we're like... We're the, it's called the pirate ship theory. Have you heard of that? The, the, pirate, ship, the pirate ship theory? No. Okay, so being a Green Beret is like, like being on a pirate ship. So... We got this, this kind of sh- this ship that's not very well maintained, right? And there's mm-hmm. 12 Americans and a crew of 120 indigs who mm-hmm. don't share culture, probably don't use toilet paper, <laughs> whatever. We got they're going to say, hey, you need to sail this thing over here and you need to do this mission, and I want you to do it for eight months. And I'm like, okay. And then they don't give you a whole lot of other guidance. It's like mm-hmm. you guys figure it out. So we're going to sail in there. It's going to be slow. It's not very expensive. It's not very sexy. It's probably not very sanitary. <laughs> <laughs> And as we're sailing in there, you know, on the left-hand side, this this nice, sleek, expensive Navy destroyer is coming by. People sun tanning on the on the deck, and they're flipping us off. It's one of the special mission units, right? Yeah. And they're going to go in, and they're going to hit their target, and they're going to be in and out. And they're going to be flipping us off on the way back, sun tanning. Very expensive to use. Very good at what they do, right? Mm-hmm. Like, okay. So as we're going now, this battleship's going to come over on the right-hand side. It's the Army Rangers, right? They're going to go in. They're going to smash some some shit. And they're going to... There's a bunch of them on the deck flipping us off, and they're going to go in, and they're going to go out, and it's going to be shorter duration. And us, we're going to we're going to sail in there. It's not going to be very pretty, but you know it's going to low American footprint, low cost, longer duration, mm-hmm. right? And we're going to have long term effects on whatever it is that we're doing. And then you know sailing back there, there might be some fighting at one of the <laughs> one of the one of the pirate coves or something mm-hmm. on the way back. And, and as we go in, there might be a lot of stuff on fire, but it's going to get done, <laughs> yeah. and it's going to be at a at a, a lower cost, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So it's you're just working with whatever wherever it's locals to accomplish something to where we're manipulating and influencing the environment around us to to solve the problem versus unilaterally doing it ourselves. It's like treating the cause and not the symptoms, yeah. right? You're treating the overall cause. You're 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 putting a long-term solution in there mm-hmm. and i i think the best sales pitch is you're putting less american boots on the ground mm-hmm. and less americans in harm's way yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't need that much like even though you were in the b23 in iraq and you had all these assets overhead mm-hmm. the true quintessential green beret mission is to hey mm-hmm. you give me a mission and a compass and i don't need clothes and and maybe of, some boots because walking and, on, and a bag of money yeah, a bag of money. just leave me alone and just hey, figure it out right yeah. here's mm-hmm. Um, here's your mission. I'm mm-hmm. not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I want you to do and why. But you, you can figure mm-hmm. it out. You tell me. You, you figure out how you're going to do it. Yep. Give me commander's intent. Yep. And get on my way. That's so it. that's why you had been tasked with one green beret for every twenty. Ten Afghans. Ten Afghans. Yep. Okay. So sorry. So go. Did, I think it's important just to explain that point. Or people are like, why would it make him do that? Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we went in. It's funny. Like, okay, that, that equals like 88 people. And I remember arguing with the commander. Higher command is like, why are you only taking so many people? It's like, that's the math, man. Here's where we're going. The Air Force is giving me a planning consideration of 7,500 pounds per bird. When you do the math, this is what it equals. He's like, well, you should take more people. I'm like, I would love to, but this is the weight capacity of the bird. He's like, well, if you just take more Afghans, you can take more Americans. I'm like, oh. Yeah, that'd be cool if the bird had an infinite lift capacity. Yeah. No, this is what it is. <laughs> you sling them underneath the helicopter, you know. This yeah. is just what it is. And I knew my math was on me because I'd gone on and done lift checks with, with my math, and mm-hmm. that's generally what it was, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe on and off. But, so we went in, and, and, you know, these things are often over-exaggerated with any numbers. I was like, there's, in my head, I was like, there's no way. There's, and there probably yeah. wasn't that many. How many was, did they tell you? They said there was 800 in this whole valley. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so, but they said where we were, there was, I forgot how many they said, but they could reinforce with all these. Mm. And our sister team that was with us had gone in two days before and they got their asses handed to them. Mm. Um, they didn't lose anybody, but like it was, it was severe fun. I wasn't saying they got their ass handed to them. They controlled the situation, but the, the, they were pinned down, they were fixed in place mm. and they ended up making it out. And then we were going in and funny enough, as the day before we were going in, I had a general officer was just yelling at me and everybody was like why are you guys wearing these uniforms these are not authorized like another authorized i pulled the siege of soda uniform policy he's like no sir these are authorized Look, he's what like, were you wearing it's bdus oh okay right? and modified I'm, modified bdus yeah 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 he's yeah. like, yeah. like, mm-hmm. like there's no way i was like look it's it's an authorized uniform yeah. policy he's like 
And I'd work with this guy for a while. I was like, Chuck, I just know that one of y'all is going to get fucking shot because you don't have the, you don't have the uh, discipline to wear your uniform properly. Oh, my sure God. Enough, I got shot the next day. So maybe you had a point, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> you got shot because you didn't have an Army uniform on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we go in this valley, and we're trying to be very quiet. So we land. The birds got shot at when, as, they were, as they were leaving. But we could hear over the radio. The app. They didn't know where we were, right? So, and, and our plan was no, no breaching until we got to the center of the city because our basic temple at that point in time was we had three elements a c2 element or assault force one assault force two and we'd break up and like you said there's not so many c2 people. is command and control yeah so, mm-hmm. so with my and we had sub elements in there so my element you know i had four green berets but with me specifically i had me and one of my chemical reconnaissance detachment guy non green beret mm-hmm. and then a bunch of afghans right and then my senior medic in another American attachment had another 20 Afghans and, and we might not see each other for 24, yeah. 48 mm-hmm. hours, right? Um, yeah. Even though we're in the same assault that, That's force. a tough leadership role in combat yeah. to, to, to maneuver indige yeah. by yourself. That, that many. That's, that, that many. Like be, being on the ground, like later on in the war, I did unilateral ops, right? right or my guys left and right with my teammates, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's so simple compared to maneuvering indige like that yeah. in a very, very dynamic environment man it, it is tough and you never wanted to intermingle like we would never come to the same building because what would happen is if if i linked up my force with say the senior medics force and they get intermingled in that building all of a sudden you'd end up with two extra afghans right like so <laughs> you, you, you always yeah. like try to keep it separated yeah and, and it was fine you were comfortable being mm-hmm. in that situation uh so we move into this this valley and the whole template was that we were going to get to this position before sun up, and then we set up these battle positions and we're trying to bait their fighters out so we'd kill as many people as possible mm-hmm. while getting the high value targets we're after but as we're getting in one of the our assault force one could not get into this building so they had to blow it once they blew it together on the radio like yep we know where they are mm-hmm. we're moving that location mm-hmm. do you have um, air assets yeah we had ac-130 so okay. ac-130 is great because generally when you're landing you get apaches you get ac-130 yeah. and they pat the, the sensors and their their ability to spark was like, hey, okay, I think that that's that's the target building we're going to. Hey, can you can you, can you do something right? Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, you can see where you're going. Great sensors, great eyes. And then as we're moving in, it's taking us a lot longer than, than we anticipated. So the sun's coming up. Um, we're, we don't even have a foothold. The, the buildings we thought we were going to set up in battle positions were not tenable at all. And this place was like a maze. Like the overhead imagery, imagery did not do this place justice. It was mm. this crazy maze. And we finally found some battle positions that we thought would work. I was like, all right, man, we got about an hour before anything happens. So I take a small little little power nap. And right as I sit down next to the radio, security's out. We've got all of our positions set up. All of a sudden, people run and they start jumping on top of me. Grenades started to come over the walls. So the enemy got right up on top of us. They got past our security, mm-hmm. and they were within 10 it, meters it, of it's us. It's bright now. It's bright now. So the Spectre gunships are gone. The Spectre, they don't play in the daylight, right? Um, so with the new, the new, so at that point in time, we had the new AC-130 Whiskey, which okay. was the pressurized yeah. version, but he wasn't on station at that point Okay, time. So he should have seen them. He would have seen them at that if point, he was up there. all yeah. we had was some mm-hmm. ISR assets that weren't looking at that, mm. but and all of a sudden, it was just this massive, quick gunfight in all our battle positions. They were right up on top of us. So I took an element out immediately and we, we pushed a bunch of them away. And that's what we started doing. We started, I would push out an element, come back, support the other assault force going out and doing the same, trying to push these guys off of us. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. And they're within hand grenade range now when, yeah, they, when so, they, they attacked. Yeah, mm-hmm. so they were, they, were, they were right up on top of us. So we pushed them out. We'd, we'd taken a couple prisoners and we got reports that they were setting up an ambush line to our south to try to attack one of our little kill teams coming out. So we hit them with, with a Hellfire missile, and I led an assault force out to go. We were going to try to get behind this ambush line and get them. But we got ambushed on the way there. So at one point, we are going through this alleyway, come out of this courtyard, and from 25, 50 meters away, multiple PKMs, a bunch of other people. The PKMs the, as a Soviet belt-fed machine you know, gun. Yeah. And one of the Afghans got hit. Most of the other Afghans ran away, like way away from the position. Not mm-hmm. like I, w- I came around the corner. At this point in time, it was me, my senior medic, um, I think a combat camera guy, actually maybe, and and that was it for Americans. And then Afghans left. There wasn't that many around. Uh, I was trying to call in Apaches because they were overhead at this point in time, and both their guns were broken. And they had rockets, but I wasn't I wasn't comfortable with shooting rockets. I didn't even know what was going on on the corner. I could see this 
the Afghan through this crack, trying to return a fire, but there's just a bunch of fire coming mm-hmm. in. That's the helmet cam footage I said I'd get you. The helmet mm-hmm. cam footage doesn't show the before. It just shows after I get shot, unfortunately, which mm-hmm. I'll give you the whole thing. I'll give you the whole Yeah, the whole yeah, video. yeah, yeah. And if you're okay, I'll, I'll put it on my yeah. YouTube channel. Yeah. So, but at one point in time, I said, okay, we've got no aircraft. We had no fast movers overhead. A-10s were inbound, but they were 20 minutes out, and these guys were coming up on this this Afghan. And in my head, I was like, the risk to mission at this point, if they grab this Afghan, right, it's going to throw the entire thing off. We're going to be here for weeks looking for this dude and his sensitive items. It's worth the risk to go and grab this guy, it, even though some of us are probably going to get shot doing it. It's mm-hmm. worth the risk to grab this dude and, and that, get, that's get him the off guy the you're X. going you're going after. Yeah, that's the guy. That, no, this is, yeah, the wounded Afghan that was stuck in the kill zone. So it was oh, a close okay. ambush. So he got hit. Yeah. He was in the close ambush, and he yeah. just falling like a sack of shit. Oh, the reality okay. is. He got a couple fingers shot off, and he was shot in a through and through the leg, which wasn't that big. Mm-hmm. He just he thought he had died. Because talking mm-hmm. to what do you think? He's like, oh, I thought I was dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, he was there. Okay. All of his butt. So we finally got the Afghan platoon leader and about four Afghans, and we're like, okay, we're going to go fight our way into this kill zone, mm-hmm. and we did. And right away, there was two guys bounding, and it was they were impressively good. One guy was shooting, one guy was moving, and I'm shooting both those guys, and then silenced one of the machine guns and. As I was going to reload my magazine, I hit my grenade pouch. I was like, oh, shit, I forgot I still had grenades, right? Um, so reload, grabbed the grenade, threw that to where another machine gun position was, and I thought that had knocked him out of the fight because he mm-hmm. stopped shooting. So we're trying to drag this dude around the corner, and this guy's just dead weight. Like, he does not want to, Even though he's talking to me, mm. like, and I don't understand what he's saying. He's, he's not like talking, but he's just, yeah. like, laying there like, yeah. a, like a sack of shit. And I'm like, what the hell? And the Afghan platoon leader moved up to where he could fire under the wood line. All of a sudden, this machine gun started opening up on him again, and it was hitting all around him. I went, I was like, okay, I got this dude. I started shooting it where I was like, I know where he's at because I could see his muzzle flash, but I was off to his right somehow. And he quickly transitioned to me. And then his first round hit me in the right leg, which knocked me forward, kind of like in the Superman position. Mm-hmm. Next round came into my, uh, hit my shoulder blade. And that round went all the way down and lodged in my lower back. But that one broke through my brachial nerve complex in the artery mm-hmm. in the arm. And then a third round hit me in the butt cheek, landed in a little shit ditch. And then the rest of his rounds went around me. Mm. and the PKM only has a 100 round belt so I knew he had to reload so I was like okay I know where this dude's at I'm gonna get him I got up to a knee and I could not get my right arm to bring my weapon up it just would not work I was mm. like okay that's bad and then the round the, leg, the round that hit my leg in the back felt like a sledgehammer too it's like at that time I didn't feel a whole lot of pain but I was like okay this is bad I signaled the Afghan that was next to me because he had a, he had this dude still and I was like let's drag this dude around the corner and get back so when you see the helmet cam footage, I come around the corner like, Dan, Dan, I'm hit. So I told our medic, I was like, hey, be prepared. We'll set up a CCP here. I just didn't know it was going to be me that was shot. Yeah. Uh, I came back around, and then that's when they, they treat me on the lower back and asked for my weapon. Where, where was your got, pistol? It was on your hip? Yeah, it was on my hip. Uh, so you, this this is taken out of the fight? Yeah. Right hand? So you, you can't probably even get to your pistol, no. can you? Yeah. And then I found out, you know, we'll talk about the next trip where I got yeah. shot in the hand. Mm-hmm. But I had most things set up for a right-handed yeah. gameplay. Like, even my maps and everything, mm. I, I could not get to. Even my compass, I couldn't get to my compass mm-hmm. um, because my hand was, I couldn't yeah. use my right hand at all. Yeah. And it, it was just, it was over to the right just enough with my body armor where I couldn't get to my compass. It was a yeah. clusterfuck. Yeah. Anyway. So right now you've taken a round through the leg. Mm-hmm. You didn't hit the femoral artery or the no, femur, right? No, Just that, was, a, that wasn't bleeding that much. And the helmet came, I'm like, hey, Dan, I think I'm hitting the leg. He's like, didn't find it. Yeah. Later in the CCP, he finds it. He's like, yep, you are hitting the leg. Yeah. And they put the bandage the on The second that. one went in here? It went in the... All the way down? All the way down, yeah. And and I was it, bleeding out internally. You were internal bleeding. Yeah. So okay. we put a, they put a chest seal on the back. It didn't puncture my, my chest cavity. So mm. luckily enough. And what saved my life is we had a... Um, a, a PJ too with us, an Air Force pararescue guy. Mm-hmm. They put me in a Skedco and they'd planned to bring a CH-53 in and hoist me out. And I remember, there's not a whole lot of stories of me being scared in combat, but the one time that, and I don't remember this, so I don't think it really counts, but the, the captain was like, Chuck, the only time I ever see you freak out was, was when you reached up through your medicine days and you were like, you're not going to hoist me out of here. I'm not going to die on the end of this <laughs> rope. <laughs> He's like, please. Everybody's shooting at yeah. you, yeah. Luckily, the, there was too much fire. The helicopter got shot up on the way in. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But they, they rigged a Skedco up for hoist, and you know, Skedco's like a taco. So that put enough pressure mm. to where it slowed the bleeding down mm-hmm. to where um, I didn't die. And they were giving me Hexton. They don't give Hexton anymore. One of the reasons they don't give this stuff called Hexton anymore is because exactly what happened to me where I did crash in the operating table because Hexton is an IV they give you, and it forces it forces 
uh, all your water into your blood veins, so your blood pressure is good. And it took them hours to get me out of there. I remember they were dragging me through the streets, and they were pushing me through doors, and they're taking all this fire. And the radio, the enemies coming to the radio, like, "Yep, we're going to grab this dude. He's on a str- he's on a, a sked kill." And all the other Afghans again, they ran away. So it was just a couple Americans wow. in the rear, mm-hmm. and it's it's got to be hard to be helpless like that in combat. Uh, we, we, were you, sucks, yeah. Were you were you you were, you were conscious and you were yeah. uh, you knew what was going on but you're strapped in this yeah, freaking you can't stretcher. do anything about it you i can do... just hear what's going on and at one point the medic's like i'm so fucking tired and you were just like dying right you're like dude stop complaining i've been <laughs> shot three times yeah. well that medic had to take over my team sergeant duties mm-hmm. too so um even even after i i got medevac down i mean they were stuck and they were pinned down all day mm-hmm. long and they ended up doing what they called the mogadishu mile on the way out because the only way they could get out of there but it was a nasty firefight but mm-hmm. that medic now he went from being a medic to being a team servant on the ground and having to control this nasty fight for the yeah. whole rest of the day. So really, I got out easy. So you could say, that, like, I probably just knew it was going to be a shitty day, and I was like, well, this is how I'm going to get out of here, right? <laughs> yeah. this, this is an easy way out. Yeah, I don't know if it's easy. <laughs> but when they got me back to Bagram, they couldn't figure out why I was crashing. Um, my blood pressure was good, but I just didn't have any red blood cells left. Mm-hmm. And the first operation they did, they gave me, like, a disassociate, but they didn't give me enough of it. So I was basically paralyzed. I couldn't move. And I didn't feel like I could speak. I think I was making some noises. I, I, have, I must have had him making some noises because like, there's no way he should be feeling this right now. But I could feel exactly what they were doing as Ooh, they were closing it up. Damn. Yeah. And they wouldn't give me any more pain meds at the time because they didn't know how much morphine I'd had. Yeah. And they couldn't figure out why I was crashing. Yeah. They didn't give me enough disassociate. So I was, to this day, I like, redefine my definition of pain. There's in my back messing around. Yeah. And they get it. Once they got it closed, they gave me something to knock me out. But when I woke up, it popped back open. So they had to go back in yeah. and, and redo it again. And, and Were you still it. in Bagram when you still woke Bagram, up? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They couldn't fly me out of Bagram for a while because I had my, my red blood cell count was super low. So they had to pump me through 11 units of blood, 12, whatever it was, mm-hmm. over the course of a couple of days um, before they could fly me out to, mm. to Kabul. But the, the bullet was still in there. They finally got that out in Germany. Mm. Um, and then it took, when I got home, it stayed open for a while. So through and through in your leg? Through, yeah, through, through and through in your butt cheek, yeah. which I can see you getting shot in the butt. You got a big butt. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> but the one in your back stayed there. Yeah, well, the yeah. one in the back stayed there. And, and oddly enough, most of the damage wasn't done by the bullet itself. was because the internal bleeding. And I'll show you some pictures where you can you could fit your whole hand in my back, basically. Really? Because it was, all the meat was separated. All yeah. the, all the, and that, that wasn't because of the bullet. It was because of the, all the pressure from the blood. Yeah. You know, so much blood back there to rip the muscles. Wow. 7.62 by 54 yeah. is a big bullet. Yeah. That's not a good bullet. There's no bullet to get good to get shot at, but that's a pretty big bullet. Yeah. I, had have a lower, I had a lower back fusion last year, but that was due to remnants of that bullet being down there and mm. jacking in my lower back. And I, I, uh, I mean, we're not there yet. You're going to get shot again later on, but I, I wonder if later on in life all these things are just going to plague you when you're when you're really? out, you know? Well, this was my 30th surgery I just had, right? Oh so all this God. stuff. So yeah. I actually feel pretty good. Yeah. Like even my hand, which was probably, which we'll get into in a minute. Yeah. Like, that was pretty brutal. Yeah. My hand doesn't hurt anymore. Yeah. Like, like this morning I went on a, a four and a half mile run with my son around mm-hmm. the reservoir lake. I mean, mm. I think for as many surgeries as I've had, mm. uh, I'm pretty lucky. Stuff hurts, right? Like when I run, I can feel my jaw. Like when it gets cold, my, cold, my hand hurts. My back does hurt, but yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So you... They fly you out of there. They go to Germany or just fly you back to the States? Go to Germany, States, yeah. yeah. So they finally fly me back to the States. A couple more surgeons in the States. But what was cool is now we had this Thor 3 program where we had the, the program set up at the special operations level 4. Yeah. We had physical trainers. We had cognitive therapists. We had nutritionists. So much better than it was in our early days, right? We have, yeah. We have... Um, yeah, physical therapists, strength and conditioning coaches, dietitians at the group mm-hmm. level. They're looking at special operations guys like athletes now. Yeah. And it's so vital, especially you're 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 a, a product of it, right? Yeah. So you've somewhere you can go now where um you can do all this rehabilitation training. How yeah. long did it take you? So they all met me at the hospital on a Saturday. Uh the dietitian, the whole team met me. We came with a game plan. I had my last surgery that evening. I was back home on a Monday. No, I went home Sunday night. I was in the gym that Monday morning. I still had tubes and stuff sticking out of me, like the, with the drainage tubes you have mm-hmm. and everything. I had like a couple, three of those, I think. And, oh, and the wound was still open at first. They didn't close that up for another two, three weeks. So infection? Because like, of infection, a, was it? Um, to I let, don't know. I don't yeah. know. So they, I had a wound They do back. that sometimes. They, they, let, they want infection to bleed out. Yeah, maybe. Before they seal it. Yeah. So I had a wound vac and everything. But I was back in the gym and 
and I thought I was like working on hardcore. Like later, like no, you were so slow because I was still on a lot of pain meds. You know, yeah. I was on, basically yeah. working out a bunch of Percocet, and they're like, no, you're very slow and stupid. But yeah, um, it took two and a half months, and then I was back in combat. And funny story really? there is the neurosurgeon said it would take a year for for all yeah. that to heal. And my arm wasn't maybe because I had to completely relearn how to use my arm after that. Yeah, it wouldn't work properly because you don't want to go back too early because your liability, right? If you're not 100 yeah. your liability in combat, right? Yeah, yeah. So are you a cyborg? <laughs> maybe um but i was like i'm getting back yeah. uh, i'll take this return to duty test and the group csm who was uh brian rare at the time i like brian yeah. and then uh mm-hmm. actually the the current swick cg he was the cd set of commander at the time they're like hey chuck you're not coming back Rose, under no yeah. circumstance can you he, come he's back solid too man yeah uh, mm-hmm. i had a little bit too much to drink with my percocets one night and yeah. i and i call him up i'm like hey check it out this is gonna happen like I'm you gonna, called the cg no i called oh. the csm i was like check oh. it out what's gonna happen i was like um <laughs> I'm going to recover, yeah. and I'm going to get on a civilian flight to Germany. Unless you put a guard at every airport. You don't know what airport I'm going to fly out of? Yeah. I was going to fly to Baltimore in my head, right? And yeah. I'm going to fly to Germany. I'm going to give myself about seven days of you know personal leave, hang out in a little town there. Yeah. I'm going to catch a medevac burden, <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about you it. Call, it's called the... the yeah. The... Was he the group CSM? Yeah, he's a group yeah. CSM. I like Brian. I, I, I like Brian. I, I like Brian. What are you sure saying? From what I heard, I use the words, and if you think you can stop being a fuck yourself. <laughs> right? And then... <laughs> <laughs> so and that's exactly what i did really? i i fulfilled that promise mm-hmm. and yeah when i got out of the bird my battalion commander supported me like brad mo's like yeah we're bringing you back just mm-hmm. don't tell anybody mm. yeah when i got that bird like not a whole lot of other people were happy <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like this you're is a f- testament to the thor 3 program yeah. give you that two and a half months but you're an idiot yeah damn dude um, this is 14 when you went back 2014 mm, yep. yeah so i was in afghanistan in 2014 mm-hmm. and working at the at the uh uh camp saddle right That's mm-hmm. it's called yeah and uh there was uh the first sergeant there who became the csm later on a good friend of mine we were team sergeants together and there was a young soldier i'm not going to tell his name and we were talking bullshit and he was like yeah uh, my team sergeant's on his way out and I was like who is it and he's like Chuck Ritter and we were like oh my god <laughs> you're gonna be in combat Chuck has been shot and blown up and all that and I had gone back and sure as hell okay let's go with the next story Chuck <laughs> yeah so obviously well last part of that story is they told me okay you're back at the fire base you can't go back on all combat missions though Still made it back on a combat mission. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're very, very happy about that at all. Oh, either. you went back to the same deployment? This is not the next one? No, no. I, mean, I, I made it back to that deployment. I finished oh, out the did? deployment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. No. And yeah. then they're like, okay, well, you're stuck at the fire base. You can't, yeah. you can't deploy. You can't go out to combat. No, mm-hmm. I still made it on the combat. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were really mad about that one. They're like, hey, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> so mm-hmm. it was the RIP mission. It was, it was the last mission. But I finally got back out there. Yeah. It felt good. Yeah. It's actually probably good psychologically yeah. right to get back mm-hmm. out there and, and and get it over with instead of it's like if you're if you're you know parachuting and somebody gets hurt it's mm-hmm. better off just get up on the bird and go right than, mm-hmm. than waiting and waiting and then you know it messes with your head but yeah. so mm-hmm. you go back to the same deployment all right yeah. all right yeah. i'm a little impressed now well, chuck last um, mission i was I think, not that I think bright, my name was but <laughs> was, was was ruck chitter on the con op or something like that right <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <'cause laughs> like who's this new guy <laughs> yeah e8 uh, so, um, but yeah, we go home from that trip again, another deployment pretty close and again, got shot up near the front side of this next trip. But yeah. Again, back to Camp Moorhead with six special operations command. We got a call in the afternoon and said, Hey, and you're a team sergeant, right? Team sergeant. Mm-hmm. And like, Hey, you got to blow out the Kunduz. We we're about to retake the airfield. Um, you got to pack up your stuff, get your commanders. You got to get this bird tonight. So we already had contingencies for that. So we pack everything up, fly up to Kunduz and then... You good over there? No, you're good. I'm just making sure that it's still recording. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. So it was ass backwards, though. We, we go up to Kunduz. You know how usually, like, the Afghans are living in squalor, and we're like, this isn't up to my standard? Mm-hmm. So we get to our base in Kunduz, and I got two companies of commanders up there. Like, hey, um, we're not going to live like this, man. You guys got no run of water. It's snowing outside. You guys got no mm-hmm. power. Like, you're not going to live like savages. Like, we're going over here where, mm-hmm. the, where the core command is. Mm-hmm. They got hot showers and food. Like, you guys can come over there if you guys want to see us, but you guys can live in squalor here as you Americans as you want to do, and we're going to go over here and live live the good life. We're mm-hmm. like, okay, that's kind of weird. <laughs> so we were stuck in this old CIA base. We had MI-17s, Apaches, and everybody forward staged with us, and we were going to go so right MI-17s there. are Soviet birds, yeah, like the Soviet, Soviet birds. version of a Chinook, Yeah, basically. basically. And it was Afghan pilots. Ooh. <laughs> so we were going on these missions where we thought the enemy were, and they just they they were there, right, but yeah. not in the mass that we thought. 
And the day, commandos at this point were the ones who were actually still doing a lot of they stuff. They were doing a lot of right? the, Any yeah. offensive operations yeah. being done by commandos. Mm-hmm. The, the cores were there, uh, but they were just kind of static. Like yeah. one of the one of the first missions we went on up in Kundu is we landed and linked up with this core. It looked like something out of the movie. You know what the movie Predator where they're out there with the the minigun we've mm-hmm. got this one position and they've got these dug in fighting positions and they got their armored vehicles with rocks all over the tires and all of the woods were shot down there was mortar rounds everywhere mm. and they're like hey where are you guys going I was like we're going there like they're like don't go if you go in there you're not coming back out like look at this place and yeah. we end up going in there but they were very static right yeah. that's just what they did mm-hmm. so really they were just really just targets for the Taliban in my opinion because they yeah. weren't going to do anything offensive mm-hmm. but anyway we walk into the core S2 the core Afghan S2 office, and he's got these templates on this map, with, and he's got the enemy templated like... So S2 is intelligence. intelligence yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, the enemy's templated like four kilometers from us on his map. Not where we're looking. I was like, is this accurate? He's like, yeah, it's accurate. And it's like meticulous. Like, it's like, and the, the, the commando, commander told us, he's like, yeah, I think he's, I think he knows what he's talking about. We're going to go out in the morning and check it out. So they went out with two companies to check out that intel, and sure enough, they had found the mass of the force, and, and mm-hmm. it was an armored Afghan company with their what was called the MSSV vehicles and a dismounted company and some cops, and they got pinned down, and they were getting surrounded. So, again, we were living in squalor. The Afghans had water, so it was my, me, my company, the, the team leader, and a couple of other people we went over to take a shower in the Afghan compound. And I'm waiting on the shower, and the corps commander, the battalion commander, said, hey, Chuck, we am going to talk to you. It's like the Afghans are pinned down. He's like, I'm tracking. Are they going to make it out? By tomorrow, because we got this mission, like, no, 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 they, they can't move. They can't get out. I was like, oh, shit. He's like, look, um, we got to ask for you. He was like, where's your team leader? I was like, he's taking a shower. He's like, all right. The Afghans left 30 people back here. They left 30 Afghans from one of the companies because they they didn't think that they were very good, and they said they were a liability, so they left them back here. We want you to take your team and take these 30 Afghans, mm-hmm. load up in MI-17 helicopters, and land at one o'clock in the afternoon, and in the middle of this firefight, and take control of the situation. Like, seems re- seems reasonable. And I was like, oh, "This sounds really dumb." So, team leader comes out, brief him up. He's like, "What?" I'm like, "Yeah, this is yeah. Like the dumbest thing we could ever possibly do." He's like, mm. "You know what? We're Greenberries, and if we don't get these two Afghan companies out, the whole campaign down here mm-hmm. is shot." Right? Mm-hmm. So we're like, "Okay, we're gonna do this." So we go plan it out, and I'm planning out the HLZs. And generally, I'm on the rear bird. For this one, I put myself on the front bird, and the. the the captain was fine with it just because I figured because we were going to link up with the Afghans. We're supposed to land right next to the Afghans in this field. We load up in MI-17s, take off. It's like a six-minute flight. It's not far. Mm-hmm. And as we're on our way in, and I'm on the I'm on the ramp, I'm paying attention to comms. He patches like, hey, the HLZ is clean. As we're landing, all of a sudden, daylight starts coming in little holes on the top of the aircraft. Mm-hmm. Hmm, this doesn't seem like a clean HLZ at all. <laughs> I look at my, my GPS. It's like, we're at the primary HLZ, so we're in the right place. Mm-hmm. The place the They're ramp. just waiting for you to land so they can mm-hmm. hammer the bird, right? Mm-hmm. Well, no, it's even crazier than that. The, the ramp land opens. I'm the first one out, leave enough room for all the guys. A bunch of rounds are coming at this point in time. And, and I, I remember I was so pissed that the door gunners weren't shooting. I was like, yeah. what are these guys doing? Um, trying to figure out where we were. I don't see any Afghans. And I'm like, shit. So we've got about... 250 meters into where the fire's coming from and we got like 300 meters behind us to go and there's no Apaches mm. right I'm like what the fuck is going on there's no Apaches um, there's no fast movers over overhead at this point in time AC-130 is inbound but for some reason there was a mechanical issue to where it wasn't there mm. we were landing like it was supposed to so I was talking to Senior Bravo he's like yeah let's get out of this field like yeah let's get out of this field so we start bounding it's like we have to we have to move into the, the machine mm-hmm. gun fire so we start bounding and it was my last three to five second rush to this berm. And it felt like the whole time we're moving, I'm like, man, it feels like these guys are just shooting at me because rounds are just, <laughs> it, was the, it was like mm-hmm. wet water. Um, yep. It, Kick, us, kicking up around yeah, you. You know, you hear all the snaps. Yeah. Like, Damn it. And the last three to five second rush, um, a PKM round comes in right over the top of my middle finger here. Mm-hmm. In between the, right in between my, my middle finger and, the index finger there and it, and it comes up the side it blows out most of the bones in my hand mm-hmm. and i hit the dirt and it feels like they're shooting them just they're just targeting me because there's so much dirt i can't even see i'm pissed and for probably the first time in my entire military career i felt defeated i was like man you know i advocated for this mission i'm the one that playing this hlz and i'm about to get us wiped out like mm-hmm. we're fucked mm-hmm. um and i was just like my hand was hurting i was like I can't like even see. Shot again. The patches aren't here. 
And my JTAC was right next to me. Um, the, the commander had one JTAC, I had the other JTAC. And he's like yelling, freaking out. And I'm like, what the hell? And I'm like, I'm like, wow, Bill, what's up? He's like, the Apaches, man, I can't get a hold of them. I don't know where they're at. But then I heard the Apaches on our net. And then that's when I snapped out of it. And I was like, what am I talking about? Now we're a bunch of, we're going to dominate this battlefield. I was like, hold on. So I hit the Apaches. And this time I'm not even like panting in my head. I was like, hey, where are you? They were on the, they were on the secondary HLZ. So they had called a clean HLZ because they were on the wrong HLZ. And they were on the wrong frequency. Oh, my so God. So I was like, hey, man, I need you to come down to this push here, which is the... Yeah. The normal channel we've been using for all these missions. Mm -hmm. And Bill's like, all right, Bill, calm. He, he, the way he tells the story is I like reach over with my bloody hand and I was like, calm the hell down. This is what I need you to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't have comms with the, with the commander at the time. He was all the way down. I was like, look, man, I need you to bring these birds in, positive idea air position, and this wood line in front of us start doing gun runs on this thing and tell that we can at least push the enemy back because I don't know where they're at. He's like, all right. So he starts doing that. I look down at my hand and it's bleeding everywhere. I was like, shit. So I get up to our, I can try to see the enemy and they're shooting. I start shooting back at for the, First time my entire military career, I have a double feed in combat, right? Mm -hmm. And my hand's all jacked up. Mm -hmm. And I'm shooting my left arm at this time, right? So, no, yeah, yeah. Um, so I go to try to clear this double feed, and there's nothing I can do. It's bleeding into the chamber, mm. and I can't work it. So I put the gun down. I'm like, shit, well, I guess I'm going to start working up some fires. I can't get to my map because all my stuff is tied down in my right cargo pocket. Mm -hmm. I can't even get to my compass because it's just slightly too far off to the right. I'm mm -hmm. like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. <laughs> it's all set up for your, your right hand, right? Yeah. yeah. Even and your pistol, your med kit. Everything. Yeah, everything, so, yeah. I'm just really like holding my hand at this point in time, stopping the bleeding, and just talking to uh, the JTAC and then talking to our guys. And our guys are like pumped. They want to salt into the enemy. I'm like, stop. Mm. I was like, I get it. But first of all, we got to find out where the Afghans are. Because that's mm -hmm. our primary mission. Like, we got to link up with the Afghans. And if we move east, we're moving away from the Afghans. Mm -hmm. And then we don't, like, this is already a clusterfuck. Let's just stop. And they're they're pretty pissed. And rightfully so. They, they're aggressive, right? It's like, mm -hmm. let's get the AC-130 on station but first. But older guys like us, that's our job, man, yeah. to calm those young pipe hitters down and, and um, let's do smart stuff. And then, I mean, I got helmet cam footage from the junior engineer. Like, once we did get some assets on head, like, they're just, like, assaulting into yeah. these enemy positions yeah. and dropping bombs, right? But... And my phone's ringing too, and it's in my right pocket. I'm like, "What the hell?" And it was the it was the Afghan platoon sergeant on the ground trying to get a hold of us. Mm. So finally, I get somebody to get that out. We're talking to them, end up linking up with the Afghans. We end up dropping a bunch of structures, pushing these guys back, and they're trying to medevac me. I'm like, "Man, if you try to land a medevac bird here right now, it's going to get shot down." Because mm -hmm. all the birds got shot up pretty well on the mm -hmm. way in. So we link up with the Afghans. I'm at this point in time. I got my hand wrapped up enough to where. It's not bleeding, but it's just like dripping. It's like a slow drip the whole time. Was it starting to hurt now at this point? Yeah, it, mm. like really bad. And I didn't want to take any pain meds. So I handed off my assault force to our senior engineers. Like, all right, you're the assault force element leader. And we came with a plan. I was like, I'm going to take the armor column. We'll go down the middle of the road. We'll put one assault force on this side of the road. We'll put this uh, second assault force on the right-hand side of the road. And we're going to clear in and we're going to smash this village. Mm -hmm. um, and we called up and they're like, is that really what you need? It's like, if we're not offensive here, mm -hmm. they're just going to yeah. keep around. So we, and that pushed them back. It was like, oh shit, these guys showed up. And the AC-130 mm -hmm. was being really good. Um, now the F-16s who dropped the bomb, like it took them an hour to drop a bomb. Mm -hmm. And they were just, this dude was being a douche in the cockpit. He ended up being, he was a one-star general flying. And he felt so bad about it that he found me on the medevac bird the next day and gave me a coin. And he said, look, we haven't done a whole lot of air to ground training in our squadron. That was my fault. At this point in the war? Because I remember you so pissed. I was like, hey, man, like, you just need to get off the rods. I'm kicking you off the rods. It's, it's our ground fight. Yeah. There's other aircraft, the AC 130s, mm. they're not even asking for permission to fire, right? They're yeah. doing containment yeah. fires. It's like, and then finally he dropped his bomb. Because yeah. he's like, are you sure? It's like, man, yeah, he's trying to cover his ass, right? Um, At this point in the war, man, I'm the ground commander on the, on the ground. Yeah. Drop the damn bomb. Yeah. But he felt really bad about it because he got his ass chewed on the radio. So we kicked him off the Raws. Mm. Or we threatened to kick him off the Raws. He actually dropped the bomb and then they left. Mm. Um, but that was pretty interesting. And then we, so we cleared through this village. And then I'm in this, this I forgot what they were using. It was, it was an MSSV. No, it was something else that they had, the, the Afghans had. And I'm like bleeding all over this person's turret. And... My combo guy's like, Chuck, why are you on the gun? You're an idiot, man. He came, he's like, mm -hmm. how would you reload that right now? I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, you're right. And then, <laughs> so, yeah. so I, so he got up there and mm -hmm. I got out and had to swallow my pride a little bit because mm -hmm. I was just pretty much worthless at that point except for coordinating on the radio. Mm -hmm. and, and then we, we move out of there and then I finally get a fentanyl lollipop on the bird. 160s mm -hmm. came and got us. And then 
those guys continued to clear those villages though for the next four days. We actually lost a Green Beret the next day, mm. and I was in the hospital with one of our infantry uplift because on the bird in the next day, he got shot through the, the stomach uh, coming in there, which is a nasty place. Like those mm-hmm. fighters, again, where they're, they're very good, mm. well trained, it seemed, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and they were very determined. Yeah. You know, but they're smart. Yeah. Because you can tell, like, when we started clearing in, they just made a tactical withdrawal because they left all their cash. They knew how to fight them. Americans at that point, yeah. right? They yeah. um, they knew our response for air and all, all that. And they uh, and we killed all the stupid ones. The um, so pulled you out, Germany again. Germany again. back home. Yeah, Re- reconstructive surgery. In my head, I was like, I'm going to recover again and go back. Yeah. To like, no, <laughs> we'll be back one, in a week. <laughs> this one, when I got to Womack, is like, there's no way can re- we can rebuild that. Like your, mm. your hand is pretty much just. It, yeah, there's so many a, small bones yeah. in your hand, like that that uh, bullet fragment. I have a bullet fragment in my hand, mm. and they're like, we can take it out, but there's so many small bones in your hand yeah. that we don't want to just leave it yeah. there if it's not bothering you. I can't imagine when you get the whole, yeah, all then, those things blasted. Yeah. Finally, found a surgeon. The pioneer surgeon was like, yeah, we can fix that. Mm. It's probably never going to work properly again. But mm-hmm. they went in there, used some kind of cadaver bone, mm. and like some kind of like bone paste that they cultivate. And that's how they fixed all the stuff in the right part of the Do hand. Do you have full functionality? Uh, for the most part. You still don't have a knuckle if you look at the knuckle. Yeah, there. yeah. Um, and it's always super sensitive. Yeah. If you look at the x-ray, it's just gross looking. It's like yeah. some kind of disfigurement in there. Yeah. But yeah, it works. I mean. That's cool. Uh, the um, How long was recovery on that? Oh, man. Like to, to actually just be able to use it to write. Yeah. Probably about eight months. Yeah. And then. For it to just not hurt all the time, about yeah. about two years probably. Really? Um, wow. And even now, like half sometimes when I wake up, I can't write properly, and mm-hmm. it's, it has to like warm up or something. Yeah, yeah. It's just weird. It's but I mean that's strange. Let me ask you this, because you're not the guy who's like, oh, I'm 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 a badass and I just want to go to war, right? How do you how do you and I I know how I processed it, but how do you process being killed in combat? How does your brain go? Okay, I've been blown up really badly now i've been shot three times now i'm going back out and i've been shot again like how do you keep getting back on the horse Mm -hmm. how do you mentally do that personally not generally but how do you mentally go okay i understand that i'm in a very bad like that that last mission right okay i understand that i might die Mm -hmm. but boom this is how i process that yeah well i have a firm belief that if you truly believe that you are an unstoppable force in nature in life then your body will follow suit and it will be true right i mean things can stop you right but from a mental aspect i think that if you truly believe that and you truly know that nothing's going to stop me from getting to my end state Mm -hmm. then then your body will will follow suit with that right but then when it comes to the mental component of getting back on the horse and, and not being I mean, you're always scared. Like, I hate the r sauce mm-hmm. problem stages, like, yeah. without fear, without fear. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm always scared. Like, it's yeah. just, what do you do in that fear? Like, I mean, I was on a mountain team for three years, and I'm terrified of heights. I've, been, I've done more lying to God on the side of a mountain. Like, now, <laughs> just let me live. I will never masturbate yeah. again. <laughs> right? <laughs> just, just terrified. But you, you got to work through You got to make that conscious decision. Just, like, you got shot in the back. It's like, okay, so we're probably going to, like, get jacked up here, mm-hmm. right? But when you volunteer for the Army... Or the military, any, any war fighting institution, you know, our job is to fight and win the nation's wars. And the definition of, of war is socially sanctioned violence in order mm-hmm. to achieve a political end state. And it sounds jacked up, but but not coming home, like it's an occupational hazard. Mm-hmm. Just like if you work at pizza, getting burnt mm-hmm. um, on the oven thing is an occupational hazard. But but that is something that's inherent in, in risky in war. It's just one of those things with an all-volunteer army that you you have to be prepared for going into it mentally and and it's just what it is because on the battlefield, especially as a leader, not only are you going to put yourself in risky situations, you're going to ask this person who you're probably just at a party with their families, you know, their kids, you're going to ask that person to do things that could potentially get them killed. Mm-hmm. Right. And in the moment, you're not really thinking about that. It's kind of weird. It's, I was going to write a whole paper one time about how, is it really selfless what we do or is it kind of selfish? Because it's like we keep wanting to go play this game. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like any any professional sports game where you don't just train and not want to go play the game. Yeah. They'd be stupid. Mm -hmm. And we want to go play this game that not only puts us in danger, but other people, even though we have families and Mm -hmm. and whatnot, it's not like you're on the battlefield. Like, Oh man, I don't want to make this decision because you know, I got to bring everybody home. And I hear people say that, but the reality Mm -hmm. is that's not the mission. Sometimes Mm -hmm. losing people in combat doesn't equate to mission failure. Right. But also bringing everybody home also doesn't equate to mission, mission Mm -hmm. success. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so you got to balance. You don't want to make do undo or, or make unnecessary decisions that put people at risk, but also are 
our job is risky, right? right? And mm-hmm. you are going and you're playing this game against people that are trying to kill you. Mm-hmm. You see it in Afghanistan, and you've seen it a lot. But you have these fire bases, and if you don't, if you hunker down, you 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 welcome violence, right? If you don't push out and clear that white space around it, mm-hmm. then and and we've seen that, right? Where where teams don't go as far, especially early on, to clear that white space, we call it. Then you get rocketed more and more and attacked yeah. more and more and more. You've got to get out you're there. Just acting, you're just a bullseye at that point. Like, you oh. really are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're a stationary target. Um, mm-hmm. That's interesting. It's always, it's always good to hear somebody like you's perspective on that. Um, and it's weird. Right? It's like, okay, well, why am I making these decisions? Like, Why mm-hmm. am I craving to go out here and play this stupid-ass game mm-hmm. that's going to suck and I potentially could not come home? Do you think that's trend, or is that inherently who you are, or is it a combination of both? I think we select people that are just awful mentally, right? Like, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. But even thinking back to my days in the infantry, I think that the majority of the people in our units thought that way, right? Like mm-hmm. because you're you're training to a capacity where even if somebody is hurt next to you, your job is to still action the situation and control that first before you put yourself yeah. in it, right? And it's weird because you, sometimes you might watch your buddy be blind now, but yeah. you know that it's the right thing to do is to continue to return fire mm-hmm. control the situation Yeah, the best thing you, you can do for him is kill the guy who's shooting at him, right? Yeah. And then we'll worry about that later. Yeah. And that's why we teach self-aid, buddy aid, medicaid. It's a weird mindset, right? Yeah. It's like, okay. Mm-hmm. It's just like if a vehicle gets blown up, excuse me, the reactions are run up to it. But the reality is get security first, mm-hmm. clear a path up there, mm-hmm. and attempt to drag those guys off the X, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, but that takes a little time, and it's it's a really weird mindset to have. It it's, goes against human nature, kind does. of thing, you know. Um, but the enemy exploits that with yeah. us too, because they know that we value human life. Mm-hmm. And, and you can, I mean, Black Hawk Down is a great example. They know that if they put us in those situations, they can probably get more casualties. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you 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 went back to Syria after that. Um, after you recovered, and now you are so I'm back to Afghanistan again too. Oh, like you did 2016 and 17, but that was that was that was a pretty <laughs> short trip for a very specific special purpose. Yeah, um, yeah, I came back and then I went over to, to Syria mm-hmm. and Jordan. Well, you started major at then, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so now you are the non commissioned officer, you're the deputy commandant of the NCO Academy, mm-hmm. right? So the RSOF NCO Academy for training all our, our non commissioned yeah. officers. Um, so we get in the front, the middle, and the back. So you, if you're not a commissioned officer, you go through the selection, you got to come through basically every course. Mm-hmm. Right now it's civil affairs, sci- psychological operations, and special forces. Mm-hmm. And if for if your psychological operations, you got to come back to ALC. But for everybody else, if you want to promote D7, you got to come back through our doors. Mm-hmm. And again, you got to come back through our doors if you want to be an E8. So PYs aside, it's a, it's a great place to like, you know, a little bit of inception, get mm-hmm. people's minds a little bit, but also extract information. Like what's the health of the force? Reporting? Yeah, yeah. So... Right now, after being in SF for a very long time, where do you see, for people who are thinking about coming into the military right now, and maybe they ate the extra course, maybe they're in the regular army right now thinking about going to selection, what's the um, what's the state of special force now? Because I've been out now for two years, so I don't, I don't know. And but you would know you're you're right yeah. there with your finger on the pulse. The Dancio Academy is the best place because you're seeing all these. E7s yeah. come in and SLC mm-hmm. and you talk to them. I know I, you haven't told me that, but I know your personality and I know you talk to those guys all the time. What do you think? You know, I've told people, look, the, the people coming through special forces now are f- fitter, smarter, and more mm-hmm. motivated than we were back then oh, yeah. because they have no down. illusion to what they're getting into. Mm-hmm. They're generally... Um, even the x-rays, like a lot of them have college degrees. And I, 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 my eyes were open when I was out at the, the Warrior Leader course mm-hmm. running that, right? Um, where, do you, where do you see special forces now in this span of time? You know what I mean? We've gone through like the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and, two, and, and here we are. What's kind of your snapshot of special forces right now? Well, it's in flux right now. They're, they're doing some tests to figure out if we need to change the way we task organizing, the, you know, for combat or just how we how we're organizing the rear to better combat the, the emerging threats that are coming up and how how war is going to be conducted in the future right so mm-hmm. there's some contention there with some people but it's i'd say right now we, we don't have any major conflicts going on comparatively to wooden mm-hmm. fest maybe it's a good time to do that right mm-hmm. because it is good to be innovative and we're always going to we're always going to rage against change right but sometimes maybe that's that's good mm-hmm. maybe, but let's test it out see if it 
see if it's worth it or not. And if mm-hmm. it's not, then it's not. But like you said, people are smarter coming in, but detachments now have far more capability than, than they ever did when we were coming up. Like mm-hmm. the things that, even back when we were coming up, you go and do an, a, a single special forces team rooms, equipment locker. I mean, we had like, what, like there was nine M240 machine guns, nine M249 saws. You had 450 cals. You had Mark 19s. You had all kinds of handheld grenade launchers. More sniper systems than you could even yeah. put in hands mm-hmm. of dudes. Like you had mm-hmm. so much stuff, like $500,000 camera systems where mm-hmm. you could take pictures up to three kilometers away. Just crazy stuff. Remember we used to have that system you could put in the back of the vehicles like a remote control camera yep. from yep. CSD? That, we had so much crazy gear. Stuff, yeah. but they have even more stuff now. I know. Cause they've got, I know. I worked in Force Mod yeah. because they get all the Army stuff and they get all the Special Operations mm-hmm. stuff, right? And it, the, the SIF companies, when I was there, got all the JSOC stuff too. Mm-hmm. So it was, I like I had nine sniper rifles yeah. on my team and yeah. I had eight guys. Like, yeah. oh my God, like yeah. take half of these back and give me something different. Anyway, um, they do. And that, that's always going to be a challenge, especially for Green Berets is, is you have so many tasks you have to be good at mm-hmm. that it's very difficult to specialize, right? You do this for a little while and then you mm-hmm. do this for a little while and then you, you circle all the way back around. Um but the, is there, as we transition out of combat, right? And, you know, are we losing a lot of those combat leaders who actually did like what you did on the ground? Um, because you probably, at, some, at one point, CIBs were everywhere in third group. You'll probably mm-hmm. see less and less of them now. Yeah, I mean, most people come to like some of the, a lot of the course, even SLC, the guys don't have combat patches and stuff yeah. like that, right? So you're yeah. losing... You're losing a lot of that. But again, it's a double-edged sword, too. It could be good and bad, right? Because now, like, once you've been to combat, I mean, you're kind of stuck in your ways. Like, this is the way you need to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it wasn't, I mean, we did lose Afghanistan, so maybe yeah. we didn't do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, it does bring, if you look at it from a different point of view, is, yeah, a lot of these guys don't, but they're smarter than we are. So maybe they have some better solutions to some of these problem sets that we wouldn't necessarily think about, mm-hmm. too. So but I do think, like, we still need to pass on that knowledge, like the lessons learned and stuff like that. I was thinking about the other day, is like, even like basic, basic combo stuff. I was on around my son. He's like, well, tell me about how you set your trucks up in combat. And I was like, oh, well, you know, under this side, you had all your MREs. Under this side, you had all your, your water. And on the back for just a standard SOP, you had three fuel cans, two water cans. You just kind of ratchet strapped. And here's your gun. Like, I was going over this stuff. He's like, man, you should write that down so people just know that. You don't have to explain it. Mm. Like, You're right. Because mm-hmm. maybe some teams have it in SOP, but overall, like, that'd probably be something like, and these are why mm. we change certain things. Like, hey, use tubular nylon or not tubular nylon, but um, cotton webbing for your toe straps because if you tie a knot and you tie a little bow tie, you can just pop that thing off. You're not cutting zip ties. Mm-hmm. Like, stuff like that. It's like, hey, there's yeah. some lessons learned that mm-hmm. maybe other people It's funny right. because the way the way trucks were set up in Afghanistan for long-range movement in an mm-hmm. urban or in a rural environment, yeah, and then you go to it. Iraq, can't and we're it. like, maybe we should take the 10 fuel cans <laughs> off the side. It's yeah. probably not going to help when we yeah. hit an ID in, mm-hmm. in, in the streets of Mosul, right? Um they, but I, I, I do think that um, it, it's a tough job, man. Special Forces do a whole lot more than people actually even realize. That mm-hmm. Most people, there's a lot of dynamic missions out there. And um, yeah, the, uh, the forces driving on, would you say, I'm trying to think what I can. Yeah, I mean, even the stories say? we told yeah. about here, like the stuff that went on in between that, like with just information stuff and everything else is unbelievably the sheer amount of it's just unbelievable yeah. right and it's mm-hmm. and it's crazy stuff and it's it's incredible in my opinion like the stuff you get to do and mm-hmm. you think you're getting paid to do it mm. is like sometimes it's straight out of a movie you're like did we really do that <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. you're not quite as cool as the movie right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 when you look at the snippets of it you yeah. don't see all the work that went into it up front and all yeah. the planning and everything you're but like hey man here's five hundred thousand dollars here's millions of dollars figure this out mm-hmm. right yeah and that, that's that's the uh that happens a lot with special forces teams. They get dropped in and figure it out. Mm-hmm. Let us know what what how to drive forward, right? But um man, it's been let me look at the time. Two and a half hours, bro. Yeah. That was awesome. Um we could talk for another two hours, but I really appreciate you coming on. This is gonna be really, really popular. And these stories need to be told, you know? Um like Mike Glover said to me one time, he was asking me about stuff in combat and I was like, eh and he was like, Look we all grew up with Vietnam and World War II mm-hmm. war stories, and, and these stories need to be told. They really do. Um, well, let me share this with you. The, the yeah. toughest thing I've I've ever had to deal with in Special Forces is the fact that, so most of the time, guys will come like, hey, man, like, why do you, why do you do this? Like, 
what are you even doing as a star major? You know, obviously you could have had an incredible career as a male model, but you chose this <laughs> instead, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're like I was uh, just about to ask I'm you like, that. You're, you're right, and yeah. I, I don't have an answer for you. But <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. So all these uh, any male modeling companies want to hire Chuck Man. He, he's available. When are you going to retire? Uh, probably February of 2024. Okay. I want you to come back on here, man. I want us to chat again. Yeah. I want us to chat about. I'll come up with another we can, subject. We can come up with all kinds of we stuff. We just sit around and BS, man. We're, yeah. we're, uh, we can tell more funny stories. We can. Because there's all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on. And there's tons, man. Like, there's tons. Like, I'll tell funny stories about you in Sierra School. Like the time yeah. I threw a, a, an empty water bottle into when I was burning the poop. Yeah. I threw an empty water bottle in there and this team serum walked around the corner and he opened his mouth and that thing blew up and a flaming <laughs> piece of poop went into his mouth, <laughs> into the back of his throat, right? <laughs> Is that your first deployment? No, no, that no. was a moment, bro. Was, that's that was... awesome. That is awesome. All right, that's a good place to stop. Chuck, thanks for coming uh, on thank board. You. And uh, yep, till next time. Thank you. Cool. Boom. Thanks, bro. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm.